Welcome to Kind of Funny's Game of the Year 2022 live extravaganza right here in the spare bedroom. Of course, I'm Tim Geddes, and I'm joined by the new face of video games, Blessing, Eddie Oye Jr. What's up, Tim? Nothing much, Bless. Very excited to be here with you today. The energy is palpable. Isn't that right? Big Daddy himself, Greg <laughs> Look at Miller. Tiny is a little coffee. He's a little tiny. <laughs> you know coffee. what I mean? It's just I'm, I'm a large man, Greg. You know? No, I don't I'm think a, that's I'm the case. I don't think that's the case. I'm a chair today. Oh, man. How high is the chair today, bud? It's an average height. It's an average, it's an average, it's an average, it's an average height chair. <laughs> Look at Mike and Andy at the end of the Why are they going so high? <laughs> there, I got maybe. the stool. I got the yeah. hard stool. We're big dudes. Big well, dudes. We got Dumb and Dumber over here. Like, <laughs> 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 but before we get to them, I'm very excited to have right here at this table, straight out of PSI Love You, XOXO, Janet Garcia. Hello, I'm here despite what LAX tried to stop. I am still here. <laughs> she got here at 2.30 last night, but you oh. know what? She got here and that's all that matters. Someone else that's here, and I'm very excited about this one. From the kind of funny X cast, Paris Lilly. Thank you so much for having me. And I went to Red Lobster yesterday. Yeah. Wow. Luxury. I had the biscuits. It was phenomenal. Yeah, Luxury. yeah. I love that that's, that's your choice, but I appreciate yeah. it. Is that when you landed? Like you got off the plane and went to a red lobster? Right yes. Huh. Yes. A lot of in and outs up here, you know? No. Okay. <laughs> Almost rounding out the entire group for today, we have the Master of Hype Snowbike Mike. Yo, what up, everybody? Thanks for having me on. Excited to talk video games. Mike, why is that notebook? Why is he rubbing his paper like that? <laughs> <laughs> He's rubbing it like his, like his the top 10 note? on it. Not many people know, but I have the official top 10 list yeah. right Whoa. on this notebook. Where's Dying Light 2? Uh-huh. Uh, nowhere to be seen. <laughs> uh, boo. He got him. <laughs> now, hold on a second. Real quick. So, like, are all the pages in front of it filled, or did you start writing in it from the back? Uh, in the back. You're such back. a weirdo. <laughs> such a fucking weirdo. <laughs> I watch all that anime. Smart I've been call. reading a lot of anime. Oh, a lot of the manga. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta work backwards. <laughs> okay, I understand. Uh, and rounding out this table, we have. The Texas Street Latino Heat clicking heads and ripping them to shreds. The globe trotting head shot and nitro rifle from twitch.tv. Andy Cortez. We ran out of chairs. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm sitting on uh, like the hardest stool you've ever sat on in your life. Like yeah. this is like the most like touch this stool. Firm. 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 My ass is going to hurt so much by the end of this podcast. It's, it's, it's Nick's comedy stool. Oh, Legitimately. really? It's the thing he puts there and like pretends to stand on and like lean against oh, a little bit gotcha. as he tells bad jokes. He puts his water on it, yeah. yeah. What's important to point out is that there was a discussion early on between Barrett and the shorties mm -hmm. of like, well, only the short people can sit. I was like, I'll take one wow. for the team. He's I'll sit on the short. stool the entire time. I'll sit on the stool the entire time. And Barrett's like, no, we'll put people on it. We'll rotate them through. He was like, I know it's so, it's such a hard stool you and god know? bless you god bless you but what and i'm saying is Andy Cortez saw it and took his ass and jumped on the grenade mm -hmm. and he's he mm -hmm. just jumped on it for the team he and wasn't part of you know? i, I, I could have sat on it andy i've got the dumper to like protect me i was gonna say i'm time. double cheeked up on a monday i could i think i could handle it i gotta handle that stool greg's always told me i have an ass that doesn't quit you know so huh? greg's always said i have an ass that it's doesn't true quit, ladies so. and gentlemen you want to talk about Juicy. Okay, so he's not the final person Top joining ass. us today. <laughs> ass of the year. <laughs> the man running the show and also contributing to the top 10 overall is Barrett Courtney. Yo, what up? Feel I'm you. very excited for this. Andy and I put a lot of work into to making this set look sick as hell. Look at that, Andy. Mm. Shout out to Andy who made the, uh, the mm. kind of base wall that we have here, also the front desk. I'm really excited for this one. We've iterated on Game of the Year for the last couple of years, making it more Reacts content. I love that the hosts don't know the top ten. I love when I get your little reactions when we reveal that number six is, in fact, Dying Light 2. Super oh, Kiwi shit. 64. Hell yeah. I, I love that on, on the far side <laughs> of the video wall uh, near Andy, we got the three Game of the Year contenders, Kratos, uh, Elden Ring Millennia, and Sonic the Hedgehog. Mm -hmm. That's a really great design, Andy. <laughs> thank yeah. you, thank you. That and then right call. behind you, the master of, of, all, of all things Jack from Final Fantasy. He's somewhere down there. He's somewhere. He's somewhere down there. He's oh, somewhere. no, he's behind Trying Janet. Kill, he's behind Janet. chaos out there. Yeah. Uh, You'll sense it. Barrett alluded to this a little bit, but for those that don't know, this is our kind of funny game of the year episode. The way that we do these is each one of us, each member of the core kind of funny games cast, uh, sends Barrett their top 10 list of video games from the previous year. Barrett then takes that list, and every game that is ranked someone's number one gets 10 points. Every game that's ranked someone's number 10 gets one point. He adds those all up together between all of our... Uh, inclusions and decisions and that creates one final top 10 list to rule them all to represent kind of funny 
in its entirety. Now, the thing is, we do not know that list until it is revealed to us on this very show. So we're going to start at number 10, get all the way to number one. We'll do honorable mentions afterwards because we don't want to spoil the potential Yo, games the that might be in the, the official top 10. So I'm very, very excited about all of this. Um, but of course, normally, this is the kind of funny games cast where each and every week we get together to talk about video games, all the things that we love about them live on YouTube. <laughs> right? <laughs> kind of funny game. Um, you can also Maybe. normally get it as a or even now get it as a podcast by searching your favorite podcast service for kind of funny games cast and we will be right there mm -hmm. for you uh if you want to get the show ad free and watch it live normally you got to go to patreon.com slash kind of funny just like our patreon producers delaney twining did we appreciate you so very very much today we're brought to you by honey but i'll get to that later i want to get a little housekeeping out of the way since we do have paris and janet here we're like let's have some fun this week all right first off happy birthday eve janet oh thank you Tomorrow is Janet Garcia's birthday. Uh, but Greg, what do you guys got planned for PS11 and Xcast if we have them here? So yeah, uh, of course, we're going to do little to no work tomorrow because you're both going to do Games oh, yeah. Daily for us. So it'll be a Paris and uh, Janet episode of Games Daily. But then... Uh, since we're all here in the same city, <laughs> Gary Wood, and not in the building yet, uh, we're going to get everybody together for another, uh, the, I guess, the second annual uh, PS I Love You vs. XCAS uh, fantasy critic uh, draft off, where we draft the teams, we go throughout the entire year and play. And it's also my honor, as the man who bought it, to give year one's trophy. <sighs> To Janet Garcia. Oh, Janet Garcia did, in fact, win Fantasy Draft last year. P.S. I love you just dominating the top four spots. So it was pretty awesome. You know what I mean? We were all up there. We chance. were all up Man. there having a great time. It was good. Paris, how does that make you feel? Uh, you suck. Yeah, I suck. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Janet, how's it feel to win? It, it feels incredible. I worked so hard. I spent so much time researching, digging into the weeds, trying mm. to scout that talent. Um, and it paid off. You know, if you've ever done fantasy critic or fantasy sports, you just know how much the league becomes a big part of your life um, and how no one else in your life cares to hear about it. But they yeah. will hear about it yeah. because it's a big part of your life. Um, blessing. Mm. Uh, you're a worthy competitor. It was yeah, funny you, fighting you, you because we were on the same team, but then like gunning for that number one spot. Um, oh, yeah. This is, the, this is the first year that I've ever lost at Fantasy Critic. Mm -hmm. and How's the first year that I've ever played Fantasy Critic. I mean, so, oh. you know, <laughs> rough stats. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to finally have competition. Because up till now, it's always just been Greg Miller, and Greg doesn't really, uh, Greg doesn't understand how video game reviews work, yeah. apparently. And so, like, it's always been an e easy I pick challenge. with my heart, ladies and gentlemen, all right? I pick with my heart. What's, what's on your fantasy critic right now? Don't worry about what's it. We'll talk about all that tomorrow. We'll he's, talk about all that. I want a game of the year. He's new to the industry. He's you know, new. Like, give Shut him some the time. fuck up. Don't <laughs> worry about it. All right? <laughs> Plus, we have uh, one more thing of housekeeping. You want to talk about The Blessing Show? Yeah. The Blessing Show uh, is back. It's coming back this Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, of course. That's my video essay video feature show that i do with roger of course i host roger edits uh and this week we're putting out an episode titled the non-game of the year awards uh for 2022 where it, we create our own categories things like you know best sonic thing funniest game <laughs> just random categories <laughs> that sonic make thing. Up. best sonic thing that's my favorite category that, that we got coming up uh but that's going up on wednesday at 9 a.m pacific time so stay tuned for that that will be a youtube premiere also and so uh be ready 9 a.m we'll all watch it live together and have a good time it's looking fantastic. I've yeah. seen little bits of it. This this one is going to surprise the hell out of y'all. Uh, but that's enough of all that. We're previewing the future, but let's look at the past. What are kind of funny's top ten games of 2022? Bear Courtney, are you ready to roll the clip? I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared for a second. I was like, no, I can't. Oh, he's the whole show if he's not here. <laughs> This is kind of funny's top ten game of the year list for 2022. Number 10, Pokemon Scarlet wow. and Violet. A lot lower than I expected yeah. to see this one. We're already off to a doozy of a day, everybody. <laughs> Get ready to be mad, chat. <laughs> oh, I love it. First off, love that it's on the list. You know, I've, I've told this story a million times, but Pokemon Scarlet and Violet surprised the hell out of me. I talked a lot of shit about this game going in. Uh, wasn't even planning on playing it, and it, lo and behold, ended up being one of my favorite Pokemon games ever, despite all of the the jank and the the really bad decisions overall uh made with that game's graphic uh design and direction um but for it to come in at number 10 you know what i'll take it you know what i'll take it also so this was on my list this was my number six on my list uh and you know this is one that as i talk about it the like it comes with so many buts right where it's like oh man i love the design i love the open world but Oh man, the 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 frame rate is low, but I mean I love the story in this one, but 
oh, it's buggy sometimes. Oh, man, I love, like, X, Y. It, that, that goes on forever whenever I talk about this game. But I think what, what brought it up for me on, on my list was the fact that this is the most fun I've had in a Pokemon game since the classic Pokemon games, right? And I think that comes with a bold shift in direction. They were like, hey, what if we, what if we made exploring a Pokemon world feel like you're actually exploring a Pokemon world, right? What if we added that element of um, exploration and discovery and made it so that, hey, here's a bunch of things you can go do. Take them on in any order. Uh, this is the first Pokemon game that I played. I know they've done uh, what probably like Pokemon Sun and Moon or some Pokemon games in the past have allowed you to tackle gyms in any order. I imagine. No, this is the first one. This is the first one? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, this is the first one where I've experienced that, right? And it's been, that actually meant something for the way I, I played, going back and forth between different parts of the map and going, all right, what do I feel like doing now? And actually having that play out the way that I expect, I wanted it to, uh, for me, made this a special Pokemon game. This did not make my top 10. Me neither. It, it no. was like, it was close. It, it, it was, you know, maybe around 13 or 14 for me. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm shocked that it did make the top 10. But that just goes to show how high Tim must have had it on his list. <laughs> I didn't even have it that high. I oh. mean, I think it was my four or five on my list. That's okay. pretty high when there's only 10 slots. Well, I know, but it's like <laughs> enough to wait it when it's not on right. people's list to get it on there. Like, I'm, I'm pretty surprised at that. If, if I expected Andy would have it somewhere on his list to get it up there. I mean, so I who, who you did it at your number three? Oh, did I really? Yeah. Cool. Definitely, okay, then that makes sense. Then. Definitely <laughs> enjoyed the... <laughs> definitely enjoyed it. And when we had the, uh, the podcast last week where we sort of talked about our categories or different categories that Blessing had thought of, it made my most surprising game of the year because of how much I enjoyed it and my most disappointing game of the year because of all the issues that we had, you know, of, of all the things that did kind of make it sort of screwed up. So, yeah, um, yeah I'm not, I'm, I am kind of surprised that it didn't make the top 10. So real quick, show of hands, who didn't have it on their list? Because I did not have it on my list. Okay, wow. wow. Only me and Tim. Wow. wow. Okay. That, so makes, yeah, that, 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 that makes me optimistic for my rando pick. Right? Like, maybe, like, for no reason. It's gonna be like, if one person put it on there, yeah. too, you pop it up. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that, it's like, yeah. me and Greg really like this game. Yeah, but for me, this it was an interesting year for Pokemon because it's the first time, I think, maybe ever that two mainline games came out at the same year. Um, mm. I know people kind of don't really think of Arceus as mainline, but formally, like, they, the team expresses it as a mainline sure. game. Um, and for me, like, I... On my own list, I kind of like to just pick one in that scenario. And I, for me, Arceus was the one that was the breakout of kind of setting that, like, Arceus walked so Scarlet could run, but then Scarlet's leg got messed up. So then the run was really, like, rough. And that's really what it came down to for me with, like, not including Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Because it is so fun. And I think it marries um, what we're used to and the openness that Arceus kind of gestures at with, like, the, you know, rideable Pokemon and just the way you traverse um, but like it, it just was so rough and Pokemon games are always rough and this is like one of the roughest ones. So I'm like, Ugh. Yeah. that one kind of knocked it down for me. Um, and maybe I was also just kind of tired of having like come just off of Arceus earlier that year, <laughs> beating that game and then digging into this one. And it's like a little bit rough around the edges, but, um, certainly it's, a lot of people said it was like the most fun they've had. For me, that, time. that was the shock it was like, you know, I mentioned it in my TikTok review that I played pretty much every Pokemon game mm -hmm. uh, for this generation, right? Like I played Let's Go, I played Pokemon Brilliant uh, Brilliant Diamond, got bored of that one, right? Pokemon Legends Arceus, got bored of that one. Uh, played Pokemon Sword and it felt like more of the same. And Pokemon for the longest time for me has just been, all right, like maybe it's not my franchise anymore. And this Pokemon game, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet reminded me that no, Pokemon can be my franchise. It just takes a bit of evolution, no pun intended. Hey! Um, and this one had that, right? But what, but what it was really missing was the bit of polish. And I think that polish is what probably took it from possibly being in our top five overall for Kind of Funny down to I being so number 10. Because yeah. for me, if this game was polished and it did work and it was like the 100% like Nintendo seal of quality game that I would have wanted it to be, oh man, this would have been in my top three, if not my top two. I enjoyed this. Like this is, we've, I've talked about it on a couple different shows, right? That you know, this is what threw me off of getting all the PlayStation games I wanted played. Where it was a week of Pokemon followed by a week of Marvel Snap, right? And I had a great time with it. It was just that idea of like, okay, cool. Like I was never invested. Like I couldn't. It was like I was playing because it was enjoyable, and I understand catching them and all that. But like, even the open world didn't feel like a great open world. Like it's open, and I can go do whatever I want in whatever order I want. But I, I wasn't that like. I can't wait to see what's over the next hill, the next ridge. I can't wait. What's this guy going to say to me? What It's like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to fight you. I'm going to have a picnic with you. I'm going to drive through these very similar-looking <laughs> environments to get to the next thing, to get to the next gym. And it almost was like, uh, 
don't know if I needed this. Yeah, to me, I, I feel like w with what you're saying here is like with the open world being as empty as it was, I appreciated seeing all the pockets of Pokemon and the weird storytelling things going on of like when you see like different groups of like, here's a mob of like 10 of them and then there's one other one. It's like, what are they doing to that guy? Like there was always like, Fun, fun stuff going on. There what were they doing, Mike? There's some weird shit in this game. <laughs> they knew what the hell they were doing. Um, but I, I do wish that there, and I expect in, in future installments, there will be more things like the, um, I forget the name of the island in Breath of the Wild. The, um, Eventide. The, Eventide Island, where it's like, holy shit, I just discovered this like fun dungeon. Whereas in uh, Scarlet and Violet, like you find a cave and there might be a TM in it or something, yeah. but it didn't. It didn't feel like you discovered like a crazy gameplay thing. And I feel like we're gonna get that eventually, which is gonna be really cool. But um, I just loved the momentum of the game and actually how good it felt to move around and the mobility of sure. it. Like that's always sure. been one of my biggest issues. And I've been really reflecting on why this Pokemon worked for me so much compared to the last couple generations. And I do think it comes down to the point that it's a joy to move around. And the more you uh, get your Maridon or whatever the other one's name is um, upgraded, like you're just zip zap zooming around and like getting up on like running up the the walls and gliding and all that stuff. It just feels good. And I loved how fast and quick it was. I just wish that the world kind of like mm. matched that and like would mm. pop in as fast as you're going. Yeah. Barry, <laughs> was, was this on your top 10? I don't hold on. Let me. <laughs> Barrett has I, all our stats for the last seven years. We can't remember his own top ten. Uh, no, this did not make my top ten. I really <laughs> loved my my time with it, but yeah, uh, there's just a lot of other things that stood out to me. This was the most fun I had with a Pokemon game in definitely a while. Uh, my the thing that held it back was. Uh, even though this was like kind of more true of an open world, more so than I would even say Arceus, because that was what we like to call in the like Sonic industry open, open zone, zone, right? Yes. Um, I, I, I felt with the kind of non-level scaling, it did feel like more traditional. All right, you're kind of you can go and fight a level 50 Pokemon if you want. You're gonna have not a fun time though. So there is kind of like a more basic pattern of how you want to go through that open world. And that was like a little bit of a letdown for me. But then those last five hours where you kind of see the culmination of a Pokemon story come together. And, and it's like, Tim, when was the last time we could say that where it was like, so black and white, you know, like, yeah, totally. Those were the well, last Pokemon black and white. Yeah. Uh, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> I thought you were making. I thought you were making like a pun of like when it was so black and white. Gotcha, okay. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> Plus is on one this morning, y'all. He needs uh, a bigger it's, coffee. It's coffee. <laughs> it's coffee. Yeah. Um, and that it was really special. But yeah, there's just like uh, things here and there that um, I didn't love of the design, and uh, that's f coming from someone who didn't have a lot of like technical uh, glitches and stuff like that. Like my my playthrough was pretty smooth and stuff. So. Absolutely love the game. Can't wait for the DLC. Very excited it made our list. But what's next on our list? Number nine. Cult of the Lamb. Oh. Okay, yes. Okay. All right, all right. Good, good. Great. We, that elicited a, a negative it's response. It's the excitement, from you. but then also number nine. Bear, where did I have this on my list? I had it way higher, didn't I? Not way higher, but higher. Who knows? How about you get your own list out? Yeah, right. What's the problem? Down. Tim right. told us not to bring our laptops out, so I was looking at my phone, and I looked at the chat, and somebody like, get off your fucking phone, Greg. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, this was your mom's number laughing. six. Number six. All right, yeah. See, I would like to see it bumped up there. I loved Cult of the Lamb. What a great time this was. Um, You know, did I think it delivered to be the game of the year? No. Obviously, I had it at number six. I think there were better experiences out there this year. But from a style uh, from, I think their storytelling they did with it for what could be a smaller, you know, a run of a game, the Twitch integration we were talking about recently, just naming your followers, you know, I think if anything, what worked against Cult of the Lamb was the fact that so many people were like, oh, it's going to be like Animal Crossing with a roguelike mm -hmm. and this. And it really was just you had a torture camp that you were, <laughs> you really shouldn't care about these people. They were actually the fuel, right, Janet? Yeah, so judgy about the cult. I don't know how you ran your cult, okay? Yeah. But I cared for my people. <laughs> oh, I didn't give a shit as about As much it. as yeah. time allowed me to. Um, this one was interesting for me. I put it in my number 10. Admittedly, I still haven't finished it yet, but I did buy it again on PlayStation just because, yep. even though yeah, I'm yeah. not going to get the platinum, the platinum yeah. is too hard. But I think yeah, beat all the bosses. I get hit. I know. Like, oh. I'm not gonna do that. Come I'm on. like, there's some someone or hack some way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think you know, I was like reflecting on this game recently, and for me, what makes it so special is sure it's a genre mashup, and we've seen a million of these. But I think it uses so many of those genres well in conversation with each other. I think that's yeah. the key because mm -hmm. they could have so easily been like, oh, you happen to have like your cult, and then you like go and you know get materials or get however they want to set it up. But the fact that you can have your followers do things that will then like have an impact on one another. And it's really this like kind of cohesive relationship where you're constantly 
having a progression, whether it's in terms of what's going on in your uh, cult camp kind of area or what's going on with the dungeons and the battles. So like there's always something happening and there's always movement and progression, which I think that's something that like rogue lights um, sometimes struggle with conveying to a player as well. Sure. Um, and then just, yeah, of course, the style, the cute and the dark. There's so much personality and charm in this game. Um, it was probably some of the most fun I've had and I'm really excited to finally like go back on PlayStation and finish it. And yeah, the integration was incredible on PC. Like it was so fun. And then for, there was like that moment in time where everyone that I knew who liked this game was like watching it on different Twitch streams. Like I'm trying to get into as many cults as possible. Right, and right. there was just such like, I think they were so smart in all the details surrounding this game. That's very impressive to me. I, I would co-sign that. And I had it at number three on my list. That's my man. I played it on Xbox. <laughs> I played it on the Steam Deck, so don't worry about it. <laughs> no, but but basically everything that both you and Janet said, pretty spot on. I think what you said specifically about taking the multiple genres and they, they flowed so well together, they talked to each other very well, and it made sense in this game to be able to play it. And then just the storyline that was happening, the fact that you could be an asshole if you wanted to be with, with, with your followers, you know, the fact that you had to manage resources, you had to make sure that they were doing their things. You're doing the rituals all at the same time. You're going on these dungeon runs. And, you know, there's just everything that was got put together in this game was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. And the pace at which I felt they yes. introduced stuff wasn't overwhelming. Because yeah. you are spinning so many plates, especially by the end, where yeah. you are really juggling a bunch of stuff, let alone going off and fighting these monsters. And then we're not even talking about that, right? Of going in, fighting these uh, monsters, these dungeons, and every time getting a random superpower and a random yeah. weapon to go in there and do battle with it. So it, it was that thing of, ah... This isn't what I'm not. I'm not going to get deep with this. I hate the claws. I don't like this power. Yeah, yeah. Or that, that other feeling of going in there the next night, right, Andy? I know you know from other games of, oh, this is the loadout. I'm going to really crack some heads and be able to get to the boss and beat him on this. Like, that was special, let alone coming out and doing it. Another thing I thought that they didn't nail was the idea and I think busy work of, cool, there's your camp and then there's other sections of the island that you can go to right. and pick up spirits or whatever the, the, the devotion was. Pick, but you, it's like, all it was was to check in at a mailbox and get that pretty much. Sure. I was like, ah, oh, this isn't fun. It, this was uh, one, another game that was close to making my top 10, but I, I feel like it nailed all of the sort of city building aspects, but it's just the combat wasn't quite there for me. And I, I think the combat felt good to, like, it felt good to attack. It felt good to dodge. But what was missing for me is something that I think you enjoyed, Greg, was like, this never <laughs> felt like the Hades roguelike to me where, oh, shit, dude, right now I have the loadout that I want. Or, like, I never really felt that. It, they just kind of felt like uh, abilities I was getting. I never felt uh, ever once, like, oh, dude, I, I want to restart the run because this new ability may pop up. Like, sure. Any of the powers, like, I, I feel like they were all kind of forgettable, where I feel like other roguelites do a better job with the combat. And it, it's weird, because I would have felt like, if you would have asked me, hey, there's this new game coming out, it's mixing a town builder with a roguelite i would have said well the town builder is probably going to be the hardest thing to execute but really i think that that's the part that they nailed the the best yeah really enough like cult of the lamb should have been my dream game and there's uh, so many elements that i that i do love like when i think of cult of the lamb i think of the art style and the sure. soundtrack yep. where immediately booting up the game i'm like oh damn like this is popping right here Great right like walking walking around that world the the how colorful it is how cool the designs of the characters are like i think they they nailed all that stuff but then also with andy in terms of the roguelite aspect of it because like for me i i was like oh this might be the the new dark cloud that i've been asking for <laughs> in terms of something that is a mix between a roguelite and a, and a town builder but i think they did nail the the town builder aspects of it mm -hmm. a bit more than the than the roguelite stuff. I thought the roguelite stuff was fun, but playing it, I did find myself, you know, getting kicked back to the town building stuff and then not being as engaged with it as I wanted to. But still, overall, like it didn't make my top ten. But in a different year, I could have seen it. I, I could see it making it right. Like I think it has that quality as a video game. Agreed. Any any other closing thoughts on Cult of the Lamb? They're still doing DLC for it. Yeah. There's still yep. stuff coming, so yeah, there's more to play. Do you think DLC will get all you guys back in? I'm in a similar boat of Janet. If you remember my TikTok review was like, I liked it so much, I want to restart it on PlayStation, and so I want to restart it on PlayStation, so hopefully the DLC is meaty enough, I would restart and get to it that way. I still have the final boss to go on my playthrough. I Fake game. Depending on, it depends on what they bring in, you know. Uh, if they in any way sort of 
amp up the abilities and kind of make those really shine. Yeah, See, possibly. I feel like that would be a Cult of Lamb too. I think that's kind of what they would take away from it because I, I know, I think in general, the re- critical response to it, we're not alone, any of us, in what we thought of it. Mm-hmm. And I do feel it's interesting that we're all talking about how much we love it and we're talking about the base building cult management more than the actual combat, yeah. which is a part right. of it. And I think that's a problem. All right, let's get to the next game. Number eight. Marvel Snap. Oh! <laughs> At least it's on the list. Ah! At least it's on the list. We did that. We did that. Ah! Oh, 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 shit. <laughs> Our top ten was at more than ten once again, everybody. We have a tie. Marvel Snap. Three years in a row. Fire Survivors. Wow. Wait, wait, there wait. we go. Let's start what? with Marvel Snap. Greg, <laughs> go. I I mean, this, uh, this is my number two game of the year. I'm shocked that it's this far back on the on the list. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, a great year for games. A lot of great games here. Uh Marvel Snap, I mean, what can I say? Like, I've never once cared about a collectible card game. I've never gotten into it. I've tried it both, you know, friends playing Magic in the back of comic shops, Gwent inside of The Witcher. Just this has never been my scene. And so the idea that they announced this and I was like, eh, all right. And then for the closer we got, I'm like, I like Marvel a lot. I'd like to try. And then you playing the beta, Tim, and loving it so much and being so deep into it uh, to get my hands on it in October right around the studio launch and get into it and be like, holy shit, like, this is so much fun. This is easy to understand. This is rewarding to play. They aren't. It's a mobile game, but it's not nickel and diming me. I do not feel that, that I have to buy. I have. I have spent what twenty five dollars because I bought the Captain America pack and then two season passes so far. But like those were all cosmetic things. Those weren't. I need to get into this to really win. And again, it's based on how much I play, which is not like you know. I see uh, Joshua Yale from IGN hitting Infinity and doing all this crazy and Golden Boy streaming it. I'm like, I wish, I wish, but I'm playing here in the. The 40s. <laughs> I play people in the 40s, and I have really good games, really close games, and I win and I lose, and I have a good time, and I bet my little uh, infinity cubes and have. It's just so much fun, and it's like, how much do you want to put in? You know, let it all stack up, like battle passes, like Kevin does in Fortnite, where you let all the challenges stack up and then go through and clean them out in the last half of the month and stuff. Like, I still check in every day to at least get my free 50 credits, but I'm also usually playing a game or two. Yeah, it's number four on my list, which shocks me. I think the the top of my list personally is like very stacked, and it was hard for me to choose exactly what goes where. Um, I love this game. I've been playing it every day since September uh, this weekend. I crossed level collection level two thousand. Feel very good about that, um, and I am not planning on stopping anytime soon. Every single day, first thing I do when I wake up, I'm like, gotta get those credits, gotta get the challenges going, and like I got it down to a point where. I check in twice a day playing this game and I want to do that. Like it doesn't feel like a chore and I, that's a weird way to, to talk about video games, but y'all know when it comes to these mobile games, at a certain point, it's a chore. At a certain point, you're like, oh, I have to do these dailies. I don't want to. I have not hit that. and I've been playing this game every single day for months. So I'm very impressed with that. I love how fun it is. I love how varied it is. The locations and simplicity of making each game feel unique, I think, is the the biggest thing that this game has going for it. Um, the updates have been awesome. I love that they really are listening to what the community is saying about what they like, what they don't like, and are actually changing things pretty quickly. Like I was, I've been very surprised at how much support the game's gotten so far um, and how much they're planning to add. This is one of the few times looking at a roadmap of a video game excites me as opposed sure. to it makes me go like, Ugh, like th- that seems unnecessary or like why isn't this here or this wouldn't bring me back i want yeah. to do with avengers I, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> every time there's a road map it's just like, but i feel like they're all they're again. all done now <laughs> <laughs> looking at this roadmap i'm excited about all the things and i feel yeah. like they've done a really good job of getting them out and like giving us reasons to be excited and they've won my trust like i think more than anything sure. there i think this is a, a very good foundation for what a a marvel or a mobile game can be and it's another win for marvel games like i feel like they have been really really kicking ass and we talk a lot about how how they've partnered up with the the right teams to put out games for the amazing characters and ip that they have and uh really the genre focused things like even like with the success of midnight suns um i don't think anyone here loved it that much Paris, I don't know about you, uh, but I know a lot of people out there did love it, and that was them kind of finding the right team for the right project. Yeah. This is the right team for a collectible card game. Right there with you, Greg, where I've never been into one, always wanted to get into one, and man, this is the one. If you haven't tried Marvel Snap, I highly recommend it. It's fun as hell to play, and it's, you don't need to spend a single penny for it to be fun, but if, you want to, if you're incentivized to pay, they reward you with some really good stuff. Are yeah. we the only two people who put on the list? Uh, it did not make my top 10, but I really have a lot of good things to say about Marvel sure. Snap, right? Like hearing it from the outsider, someone who liked Hearthstone a lot, who likes magic, right? These 
card-based games. I'm so happy to hear games like this pulled you in, right? And I think the simplicity of it all, like Tim said, is what made it so much fun and engaging, right? The matches are quick and easy to understand, right? You pick only a certain amount of cards and it really limits you on like, hey, you don't have to get super in-depth and in the weeds on this. This is baby's first card game and it's easy to learn. It's fun. It has a great IP behind it with Marvel. Nice and, and like, it's awesome to see my friends be playing this and then to be able to jump in and go, oh, this is easy. This is fun. I enjoy this. I'm done. I'll come back next week, whatever it may be. Like, I really did like what they did with this, and I hope to see this continue to shine moving forward. Any other thoughts on Marvel Snap? So I'll say this. It's not on my list for a very good reason. I was over at Danny Pena's house, and I'm watching his wife, Rihanna, play this game. And I was like, this game will absolutely consume my life. I'm terrified to pick this up and start playing it. I, I get the appeal. I have not played it, only observed, but to everything that you said earlier. I mean, it's phenomenal. I get why it's in the top 10. Yeah. This is why like, I haven't played it, because I, I'm afraid to like it too much. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. I already have enough games I'm neglecting. Like, people, people love this. People hype it up. I'll get to it maybe one day. But that's why I'm putting it off. I'm surprised by how quickly it consumed me. Because yeah. it was, I think it was the day it it's came horrifying. out <laughs> where I got off of KFGD and I went to my desk and I was like, all right, I got like a couple hours to kill before PS Love You. Let me just start up, start up Marvel Snap and like see how it is. And I played maybe 10 to 15 matches just th sitting at my desk, and it just kept going and going and going. And it's the thing of it's accessible, it's approachable, it's easy to understand. I'm somebody who, you know, I played a few collectible card games, right? Like, I grew up playing Yu-Gi-Oh! And after a while, with Yu-Gi-Oh!, I got to the point where I was like, this shit is too complicated. Like, way too many rules. How, how, way too many rules, way too many systems. And, like, you know, that is for – now Yu-Gi-Oh!, I feel like it's for an audience that is – super hardcore into that kind of thing but marvel snap feels like the polar opposite where it is hey you have all these cards with all these different abilities but the game is so randomized and it's randomized in such a fun way of the in, in its setup right having the three fields having it be like yeah you play your card here and any card you play here is plus two attack right any card you play here might transform into a different card i don't know like it's random shit but also it's stuff that is fun and casual in a way that like made me not want to stop playing like every match which just was Super quick, right? Like, it feels like a card game that is made for you to keep going and keep having fun. And it, I think the biggest thing for me is that at no point playing Marvel Snap has it felt predatory. And that's been the biggest thing with me in mobile games in, in general, right? Like, you talked about that, Tim, where it's the fact that, like, I don't feel like I had to spend a dime to actually be good at this game. And I've gone to the point... I'm not, like, I'm not that far in terms of my progression, especially compared to YouTube, but I've gotten to points where I am like, oh, man, what if I did get the rarest version of this card and I, and I, and I try to go for it? Um, and yeah, that stuff feels super attainable and super fun. And so shout out Marvel Smith. Yeah, jumping off something you just said there, like, something I really appreciate about the game is it teaches you how to play games in a way that I um, really appreciate. And I, I've told the story before, but Gia, who does not play games, is playing this every single day and she gets it and she's learning things like the meta of it where mm -hmm. seeing the locations when one of the locations uh, is featured more heavily for a week or whatever and then her noticing that the opponents are doing strategies that work better at that location her being like oh I have cards that could do that too it's really cool that because the locations switch up it really makes you think about the, how to uh, attack the game differently and that it's it reminds me a lot of the classic like you know, the first level of Mario teaches you to jump over the Goomba. This game is full of those moments. And I feel like that a lot of the, I talk about this game being rewarding. I think it's not just, oh, you're getting new cards and stuff. I think that the active gameplay itself is rewarding. And it makes you, it makes you feel smart. When you pull off a great combo, sure. it makes you feel like you did something really cool. Um, yeah. But, yeah. And the exciting stuff is maybe all of us can jump into the One Piece card game together. Oh, think about yeah, it. Just came Mike, out. Let's go. Oh, one Piece. Right? What do you think? <laughs> Each game, uh, each, each game lasts like three years. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk okay. about another addicting game, Andy. Yeah, kick us off with some Vampire Survivor. Vampire Survivors was just one of those games that I heard on, I heard people talk about on a bunch of different podcasts. And then you see it being played, and I'd see it on Twitch, and I'd see our friend uh, Bruce Green play. And I'm like, this looks like a fucking mess. What is even happening right. here? <laughs> um, and then you try it out, and then you immediately understand that it really does feel like somebody just grabbed all these ingredients and kind of made the perfect like meal that just is satisfying immediately kind of feels good to hear and look and play like it, all of those senses it just sort of like immediate serotonin right you're you find the next upgrade that then kind of makes all the little bad guys go have little popping noises whenever you can boop, 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 boop. it's like oh it just sounds good and it feels good to do you see the numbers raising you get newer abilities to upgrade you get newer 
um, characters to try out that have you know special passive abilities. It is such a simple game. I think the idea that it is essentially just one stick that you have to use. It's so simple. Um, it's such a like ingenious idea, and the fact that it works so well and is a game that I have not been able to put down. I put like forty hours into it on the when it was on Xbox uh, Game Pass on PC, and then on Steam, I'm around eighty or ninety hours in there. Um, it's amazing, and if you haven't tried it out yet, um, you're definitely missing out because this is kind of like it just feels like game design one hundred and one. How do you make something satisfying? Cool sounds neat little colors flashing all over the place it's like it's like kind of like a perfect game yeah, yeah fun progression and it was a it was my, one of my big surprises it was one of the games that i decided to play over break for game of the year voting and uh, yeah it jumped up to my number seven of the year and it, uh, for everything you said andy it just it took over that entire break of just just walking around finding combos of weapons to make even cooler weapons mm -hmm. and like finding all of like the hidden levels and unlocking all these cool characters and getting into like that game gets really weird too. Once you get into like really deep and like, if you're trying to like roll credits and stuff like that and not just hit like the, the 30 minute max on like the, the first couple of levels, it's, it's a fun time and much deeper than I, I, I thought it was going to be. And it, yeah, it was one that I, I pulled up because it was on game pass and I was like, all right, I'll play this on the TV for a couple of minutes. And I immediately deleted it off of my <laughs> Xbox because I was like, I need this on, my game Steam Deck. deck. Yeah. This is yeah. the Steam Deck oh, game, yeah. and it, it, yeah, it just took over my break. Yeah, it was number six on my list, and I was mentioning this on the podcast we did last week that I it made me a handheld gamer again. Like I, I I bought a Steam Deck kind of not knowing how much I would be using it. I wanted to kind of just see if there were any games that would pull me in, and Vampire Survivors one hundred percent has made me like I put on some random TV show uh, on YouTube TV, and I just lay in bed playing Vampire Survivors. It feels and plays perfectly on the PC. Um, on the mobile, I haven't really tried out the mobile app a whole lot. I didn't um, like it, but you can't. I was doing touch, and so you can use the backbone with it, which I haven't yet, which uh, I assume is just then the game. Which yeah, is, I wasn't, you know, in a wasn't a huge fan of the mobile Free to play on mobile. But you can, if you die, you could revive by watching an ad, which I think is kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, Paris, of course, was a coward for not playing Marvel Snap and thinking it would dominate his life. Mm. But that's what I did for Vampire Survivors, where I love Vampire Survivors. I've played enough of it to know it is pure gameplay. Like I, I, It's a game that it would literally dominate all my time if I did it. And it was that thing that I've played hours of it, but it was enough that I had to stop and I had to push away and, uh, and be like, I would go and grind for everything, right? Because obviously when you beat it, you can go and take your gold and buy the different things and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, like, I was talking to Bear in the car, and he's like, well, I'm working on the secret ending. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't. Like, I can't do this. Like, I appreciate it and love it and think it's awesome, but that's why I didn't put it on my list. I'm the same way as Greg and Paris, like, to the um, Marvel Snap thing where – once people started talking about Vampire Survivors and once I understood, like, the kind of game it was, I was like, this is going to consume me just because, like, the, the, something about roguelites and, like, how they go about progression where it is, hey, man, just one more run. Like, you yeah. under, you know what yeah. you did bad the last time. Just fix that one thing, and you're going to be golden, and then you keep going, and then you die to something else, and you're like, oh, all right, like, I just need, okay, I'm going to get this upgrade and this up upgrade and trying to min-max whatever your strategy is. That is maybe like the most addicting gameplay loop that there can be for me. And I played a few hours of Empire Survivors on my Steam Deck, and I was like, I can't do this. Like, I, this is gonna be <laughs> gonna be too much for me if I can continue down this route. But it's one that like I I respect so much, and I, it didn't make it on, onto my list. But it's one that like I'm glad exists because I hope I hope there's like a lot more games like this where it is. Hey, give me just pure gameplay, just pure yeah. gameplay. Just let me walk around, you know. Just <laughs> yeah. about it I just want to move a guy. Yeah. walking simulator. <laughs> I really appreciate quick. this game because it, like, even if you just play it for a couple hours, that is such a rewarding experience. Like, yeah. I only played this for probably three hours total, and like, it was you get it. It's so yeah. damn good. Like, yeah. it's such a fun time. It's like the Andy's point of like this game looks crazy, but like it's so satisfying to play. It's like if somebody made you a meal and you looked at the meal and you're like, this looks disgusting, and then you start eating it and you're like, this is the greatest thing I've ever tasted in my life. <laughs> yeah. Like that's what Vampire Survivors is. And, uh, and just to call out really quick, because I know there's some people in the chat who are like, this isn't a top ten list. If you remember, we also had a tie last year. And two years ago, we had 15 games on our top 10 list. So it's <laughs> all just for fun and games. Yeah, it know? is. We're Solid, celebrating video games here. Mike, Solid Twitch integration away. as well. Yep. Allowing to play with the chat and let them dictate some of your moves, whether it be for good or bad, is also really fun. The music is great to play along with all the gameplay. So solid game right there. Now, Greg Miller, you are correct. I am a coward. Because <laughs> when I played Vampire Survivors, 
it literally put a chokehold on me. Yeah. I, I, that, it, it consumed my life for about a good month just playing that game and understanding the simplicity of it. Like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, walk around. And then, you know, you start seeing people say, hey, try use garlic, do this, do that. So you start doing that. And then you realize that garlic is a crutch. No, don't use garlic. There's other things that you can do. You don't need to do that. And you start really getting into the end game of it. It's it, it's just so phenomenal and it's so simple at the same time. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful about that game. I do believe the person that made it started out in casinos. I, I think I heard that. He was making casino <laughs> games. So, <laughs> so the addiction of it, yeah, like you said, totally makes sense. But I had it at my number four. That That's how much this consumed wow. me. Wow. Over, and, over the break, yeah. And there are so few roguelites that, like, it, usually when I find what I like, I kind of just stick with that, right? Sure. But there have there are so few games that I'm willing to, like, no, let me just go outside of my comfort zone and just use random shit that I never use because maybe I just thought they looked super useless. But how can this sort of change and how can this maybe improve my experience in the future? And I've, I've found myself trying to level up every ability just yeah. to see what yeah. it does and how it affects the gameplay. Super fun. Great game. Let's get to the next one. Number seven. Immortality. Oh, man. Hey, dude. Oh, hey, man. dude. Take this as a win. Because my fear was it was just you and me voting for it and it wouldn't even make the list. I was not about man. to have that happen. I'm so happy that it's on the list. I, so... Oh, we talking? Oh, yeah. 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 Everybody, it's Minogue Gage. Hello. Hi. Come on in. Star of Immortality. I was just in the bay and the, the spirit of Marissa Marcel just told me that I should I should come in here. Yeah, so. you guys, you just came in at number seven on the list for nice. Game of the Year. Yeah, nice. yeah. So okay. That's you, do you have, did you make did you make a, a number seven uh, speech for <laughs> I did. Okay. Give me a second. Everybody, I'm sorry. No, I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. This is great. Um, seven. I play seven different characters. Uh, I think, ish. Yeah, 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 that's close so enough. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll seven, take it. Yeah. So that works. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. You thank did a fantastic you. job with All this right, game. All right. Well, I'll see you guys. In the <laughs> <world>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Congratulations. She'll be hanging out with us today. Right, Greg? Throughout the day, yeah. Mano's going to be on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames, youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames, playing games with Mike, and then she's going to do the Kind of Funny podcast that you can catch on patreon.com slash kindoffunny <laughs> and later on podcast services around the globe. But for now, Immortality Bless. Immortality. So Immortality was my number two. Uh, we talked about Number it a bit. three for me. Number three. We talked about it a, a bit last week of like in the best story category and like best moment and stuff like that, right? Like Immortality has so much going for it. I think for me, starting with the gameplay of it, because you look at this game, it is an FMV game, right? It is a Sam Barlow game, and it is you putting together clips, and you don't really think about gameplay, but the gameplay is the thing that got me hooked initially because you are essentially role-playing the role that they put you into, right? Yeah. You are recompiling these, these movies, these films, and trying to figure out what the, the mystery here is, what went down with Marissa Marcel, the main character in the game, what went down with the characters that are around her, and actually going through that process of figuring out how to find the different clips, how to click certain things within the frame of each of the each of the clips to take you to the next thing like going creating my own strategies strategies of being like all right i'm gonna click this person's face and like find all the clips that they're in all right now i'm gonna clip click on crosses because like there's religious films in here to see what clips these take me to uh that form of gameplay was unlike anything i've ever played before in a video game it sure. felt truly special and it was truly addicting but then that then feeds into the story and the mystery of it, which like is very hard to talk about without spoiling. And this is a game that I do not want to spoil the mystery in, but it's it, on Game Pass. It's on Netflix. Go play it if you yep, haven't played it. You can it. play it on your phone if you want to. Um, but that story was just so engaging. And the way they go about creating three different films uh, and like making them making them this like found footage thing of you are you are finding them doing the takes of the films, right? It is like a lot of the, the clips start with all right, uh, this movie, take two, and like they do, they, they do the slate, and then like they, they play out the scene. The performances in those are so great. Uh, Manon, who just came through, did such a fantastic job in that game, uh, playing the, the role of Marissa Marcel, and the role uh, the roles that Marissa Marcel is playing in, in those films, uh, let alone the cast around her, do such a great job. Uh, but yeah, there are, there, are, there are like unlimited things I can say about this game that I absolutely love. Yeah, it's incredibly special. You know, I've been a Sam Barlow game fan since we started with her story, right? That was an old, old, the original spare bedroom playing stuff there. And then Telling Lies I really, really loved. And I had the notebook full of notes and craziness. And then for what immortality is and what's 
shocking is I feel like you could take her story and make that over and over again and, and change the name, give a different story, but have it be so similar. And the fact that Sam Barlow's games go and take the idea of searching a keyword, doing this detective work and finding it, but make them fresh every time is so crazy to the point that is somebody who loves to play games and not necessarily watch stuff all the time. Immortality, I was like, oh, okay, like three different movies to sort through the footage to click on. I don't know if that's really what I want to do. And to Blessing's point of being becoming obsessed with it, to be completely caught off guard by what the real story is of what's happening in that, and to go all the way down through roll credits, you know, not have found every clip and have discuss discussions with Bless, with Rebecca uh, from IGN, the spoiler cast we did, and find out where I was wrong, what my theory was, how it did work, how it didn't work, how that played out. There's all of that for you as the player side, let alone the performance side of, you know, what uh, Manon's doing over there of just like the different characters. Incredible. The, the, again, the, these moments you catch before and after a scene are also so important to what you're trying to figure out, right? Let alone how they're acting in the scene. Like immortality is super special. Incredi it, incredible acting. The performances legitimately blew me away. Like I totally understood why she was nominated for this role. And, and also uh, one of the male counterparts in this uh, game is also just incredibly good, and I think the things I mean, that they I, all are, yeah. I think the things I enjoyed the most about it were those the moments where the moments before the camera cuts or starts the shot. I love the little acting there. This is like just yeah. little small character moments it, that they have that are so damn good. The way that she'll like uh, Manon, for example, she will shift from being Marissa Marcel, and then clip starts, and she's an entirely different character all within one clip. Like moments like that made it special. I, there, there are certain scenes where. There are certain clips you'll find where you don't know where it's going, but then you get halfway through the clip and it's like, oh, this is the clip I've been looking for for the yeah. last three yeah, yeah, hours, yeah, yeah. trying to figure out what the mystery of this thing is. You, I, you don't, you never know what's what's happening next, right? Like somebody in, in chat earlier on asked, like, if the story is hard to follow, and that's another thing that shocked me is that I thought it was surprisingly easy to follow, and a lot of that is the fact that you can kind of determine where you go. You know um, what objects are going to take you, or you you, you kind of know what you're searching for within the clips. I know this movie is about, you know, this relationship between a man and a woman and he's a priest and uh, like, I forget what she is, but like she's she's just a woman, right? And like, okay, cool. Let me click on all the religious Im imagery in this movie to figure out how I can get to the other things in this movie. Okay, this other thing is about an artist and a muse. All right, let me click through these things. And the way that the game, I think, is designed in this smart way to give you so much agency as a player to figure out where you want to go and actually give you the tools to get there and then like, Feels like, like when you get there, you're like, oh shit, I this is what I I've been looking this. for. I yeah, did this. Yeah, yeah. I, I found this thing. Uh, yeah, no, this this is so impressive, and I think it's it, it's so good with the performances that lifted up as well. The the I was really interested and intrigued by the three movies that they're making within the game. Immortality didn't work for me like I was hoping it would. Um, it kind of reminded me of, I, I think maybe I was just spoiled by the experience of Inscription, where mm. when the twist happens. You think that's the twist, and then a whole wall is knocked down to expose you to some gigantic thing happening, and you think that's the thing, and then suddenly there's layers and layers. And with Immortality, when you experience the twist, I kind of just got more and more of the twist. Now, more and more of that is letting you know what the story is and stuff, but I was I was hoping for, like, an extra level. I was hoping to get, like, a text message and be like, oh, my God, look under my bed. Or, like, <laughs> I, was, I was just like, turn around. Baby. I was hoping for a, a bit deeper of an experience, it, like, Inscription gave me, where it just kept on kind of revealing, revealing more and more about the world. Um, still, like, really, really interesting at its core with what, with what it's doing. When you get that first moment, it's kind of shocking, and you're like, what the fuck is going on here? And I love that feeling in games, and I just kind of wish that it kept on unlocking more uh, and more but still really really cool concept closing words go play mortality yeah all right let's get to the next one That's number six neon white okay there you go that's lower than i thought <laughs> is there an ant <laughs> we're running out of games y'all we only got five white, numbers numbers here. Here. Yeah. neon white who wants to lead this one off this was my number two game of the year. This oh, was wow. my easily my most played game uh, this year. Um, it, it, it's it's rare for me to get this infatuated with a game that you could essentially just beat in like a couple of hours. But it's that simple leaderboard thing uh, of you know playing through these levels that are supposed to really only take you 
maybe 30 seconds and seeing your friends list of like, oh, you know, Andy beat me by a second here. Jeff Grubb beat all of us by 10 seconds here and stuff Grubb. like that. And just getting so addicted to that back and forth. You know, I, I loved watching Jeff Grubb stream this and then also play while he's streaming and beat his scores live on his stream just to fuck with him, you know? <laughs> um, and there's just something about the the motion of playing through, of, like, running around, finding water to, like, sprint even faster on, uh, get a shotgun, uh, shoot that, blast in any direction that you want. There's just something about the gameplay that is just so addicting to me that it's, like, it's almost like a nightly routine where Alyssa wants to put something on. I might not be super interested in it, and then I boot up uh, Neon White's Heaven Rush where you just play through every single level and just, like, see, like how fast can I truly beat this game kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, I absolutely adored this game. This was uh, the biggest surprise for me because it was not on my radar until that stream with Andy and Roger. And I saw them like going back and forth on a, a level of tour. And I was like, oh, this game is very different than what I thought it was. And yeah, I absolutely adore it. I, I, I also want to shout out the, the story. I know whenever this game is talked about, people kind of like shit on like the story and the voice acting and all this stuff. I enjoyed it. I know that like maybe the uh, script and like the dialogue and the performances wasn't everybody's kind of thing, but I, I really enjoyed the the story and kind of like the interesting kind of take on the working class and and, and all that stuff in a in a weird kind of heaven um, uh, landscape. So yeah, I I absolutely love this game. This was number eight on my list. Um, I think if the story and characters would have hit for me in the way that. Hades was kind of a, a complete package yeah. with the gameplay and then going back to the underworld and conversing with all these different NPCs. I think it would have been much higher for me, but this game is still like, I think, perfection gameplay wise. Um, the escalation in abilities, the um, like Barrett was just mentioning, all the score chasing that we were doing, the amount of times that I went to school off of Jeff Grubbs and then I beat it, like, I'd be like, how is his so high? And I'd watch his stream and go, oh, that's how. And then I'd beat his score. Incredible. Like, and, that but, and by like a hundredth of a second, too, <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that feeling was just next to none. Um, the movement, the overall aesthetics of just like a complete concert of sound and visuals were just, you know, I think topped. Like, you cannot really do a better job than they did this year. Um, game is a lot of fun. And it just keeps on adding on more and more abilities. And when you think that you're done adding more abilities, there's two or three more. And it never feels overwhelming or too difficult. Um, I just think they kind of nailed that formula of like, here's one more thing. And now there's a rocket launcher that pulls you towards your, your target. Like it just kept on getting better and better. It was yeah. uh, number nine on, on my list, and it's because of how tight the gameplay is. Yeah. And like, I love games where there's that that sense of flow, where you're just kind of like in the rhythm of it all. And this is definitely one of those. Uh, last year, maybe two years ago, there was Boomerang X yeah. uh, that Andy got me on. This reminded me of that uh, as well, just kind of with that extra element of the the music and everything. Had a great time with it. And to your point about um, all the the varied um, abilities and things. This game did something that I, I rarely see and I really love, which is be presented with an option of, do I want to go with this ability or this? And I actually want both of them. Oh. And like that reminds me of Hades in that way of just like, I, I really enjoy both of the things being presented to me. And I feel like each run, trying out the different things to find what you like was part of the, the most fun I had with the game. Yeah, and just like the, sorry, really quick, uh, just before I lose the thought of the different levels uh, of design that you really kind of discover while you're playing the game and replaying levels and, so, and stuff like that, where you go on your first run and you kind of like, oh, I understand the flow of this. And then it's like two hours later, you go back to that level and you're like, oh my God, there's like three or four other different things I could have been doing this entire time to like really shove, like shave down like, 10, 15 seconds and stuff like that. And there's just a, something about the the level design in every single level that just like really blew me away. Sorry, Bless, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So Neon, Neon White was number nine on my list. And it was for some of the reason that Andy mentioned of if the story and characters got me in more, I think it would be way higher. But this game is just so much for me, just pure gameplay in a way that I really love. I think the design of it was super tight. This game got me into drum and bass also. So shout out to that. I think the soundtrack was very fantastic. And just the visual design alone, right? I think... This has been a year of games that have fantastic art styles, and Neon White is included in that conversation. From the moment, I, it must have been like a Nintendo Direct or some some showcase where we, we first saw Neon White, and it was that thing of, 
oh, this is from the the Donut County people? <laughs> yeah. All right, like, I guess. And then, you know, you watch more of that trailer. At least for me, I saw more of that trailer. And I was like, oh, actually, this looks really interesting. And then you see just these really interesting, weird systems that seem to be working together, right? Like, you have this first-person game that is driven by, like, a card system, right, where you're spending cards to do abilities. But also, it has, like, first-person shooter elements, but also it's a speedrunning game. And the more you talk about Neon White in terms of pitching what it is, the less it makes sense. Like, there's also a visual novel in it. Like, it makes no sense when you try, yeah, to, when right, you try to pitch right. Neon White. But when you play it, it works as intended. And I think for the creativity of the design alone, it deserves to be up here, let alone the execution and, like, again, how 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 good it feels, how how quickly how quick it feels when you actually get into it and you understand what the game wants from you and you understand, like, you get into a new level and it is all right, I got this thing and this thing. Oh, man, I got to learn a new a new weapon. All right, how's this going to go? And the first time you go through a level, it's like, what, a minute and a half or two minutes by the time you finish it? And then you go through it the second, the third, the fourth time, and now you're down to 20-something seconds. And it's like, it's oh, okay, so good. I so understand satisfying. what this is. It is so satisfying. It teaches you super well exactly what you want or exactly what it wants from you. But then it takes it, takes it a step further by adding in, in pretty much every level, I believe, a secret, secret path so you can speed yeah. run it even faster. Um, yeah, I think Neon White is just an excellently designed game. And it's also one that I think speaks to 2022 as a year in terms of our top 10 so far being, what, Cult of the Lamb, Marvel Indies, Snap, baby. Indie Immortality. Central. Like, it is such a year for indie games. But I think it's also such a year for games that speak to individual tastes um, so much, right? Like, I mean, Individual. In, <laughs> individual. Yeah. That's, that's terrible. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. Still going. Everybody he still has it. He still has it. Also, really quick, from now on, I just need every game. Uh, whenever I get better at something, I need every game to have Steve Bloom whisper in my ear. I just keep getting better and better. And his spike voice from Cowboy Bebop. Come on, man, it's so dope. But yeah, this is such a year for games speaking to individual people's tastes in a way sure. that I think. It, I, I think on one hand is very special. On a, another hand, might make people go look at lists and go like, oh, "Are these really a top ten games of the year?" But I think for us, for sure, yeah, yeah like look at these games. It's, I think these are all incredible. It's but. gonna be funny after saying that, and the next five are all AAA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It's like show me Kirby. Great year for AAA but as well. To add on to what what Blessing is saying, and you know, trying to follow that up is gonna be hard. But for me, if this was number eight on my list. Everything that you guys have said, I'm not gonna try and repeat it too much, other than the fact that this was also one of my go to Steam Deck games. Yep. That this is this is a game at night I want to wind down. I'm picking up neon white, I'm doing speed runs, I'm trying different things. And to your point, the visuals of this is what kept driving me to want to come back and play because I just absolutely love the art style of it. And to Barrett's point, can't go wrong with Steve Blum in your ear. So yeah, it's it was a fantastic game. And along the lines of what you're saying, as far as with this our top ten list being heavy indie focus, I think that's a good thing because I think we went into this year knowing it was gonna be kind of lightish. On the, on the bigger AAA games and to see all these indie games step up and really be that fantastic and really you want to pump, you know, literally hundreds of hours into these games throughout the year is fantastic. Neon White was definitely one of them. Yeah, I definitely think one of the themes emerging from this list is that gameplay focus because yeah. I think, like, while the Tiberius point, people were splitting the story and, like, this didn't make my list partly because I did not like the story. And I think it very much is, you know, if you have more anime sensibilities, I think it kind of does some more interesting things and you can kind of pick up on that more. But just in terms of just the movement and the speed and the excitement of that is so cool. And I love when games, it, it's interesting because just finishing the level isn't necessarily super challenging, but I love when games present a challenge, but they decrease the time that it takes for you to do it, which I think enforces the desire to do repetition. Like the number one thing I hate doing is having to like do something really difficult and then failing at it and then running it back and knowing, oh my God, that's like 10, 20, who knows how long minutes of progress. But this, you're in, you're out, you're going. Um, that leaderboard was super fun. I played this on Switch, it ran amazing. And it has this like beautiful mashup of like a funky art style meets cards meets Doom almost with just the fact that you're fighting these demons. And I think that stylization feels so retro and yet modern all at once um it was a really fun one and even though it didn't make my list i think that's definitely a game that if anyone asked me about it i recommend they check it out because the gameplay is just so good and so tight and so well designed the katana zero just like hitting the button to refresh yeah. oh my yes. i fucked up hit the button to refresh it hit like goddamn i'm spamming that thing for hours <laughs> I remember katana zero what what a good dude game. we need what to get a new game. katana zero i miss yeah. katana zero and to paris's point about the steam deck this is a such a perfect steam deck game in the way that it is pick up and play. Oh, I'm going to do a level level or two, right? And you go through it and you're like, all right, that was fun. You put it down and you pick it up the, like 30 minutes later if you're me and play, you play, <laughs> and you play another level. It, um, it's the game that
game that got me uh, sold on uh, back paddles. That was, like that was like, really mm. the, the thing where I uh, swapped. I think my bumpers. Welcome over to 2019. The... Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, dude, welcome it, to the fucking dude. future. <laughs> Holy shit, we've been yelling about it for years. I know you guys have been yelling about it for years, and now I'm just saying I get it. Okay, this, this game Jeez. also sold me on uh, Gyro Gyro. I've always, I always ne- never know how to pronounce Hero. it. Hero. <laughs> <laughs> it is not your but that game, stop that, that controls thank uh, you that game that game sold me on that in the way that I, what Andy and other people who play Splatoon were always like oh man no this is the way to play Splatoon and I'm like I don't give a fuck about Splatoon <laughs> Neon White sold me on, on that control scheme where I'm just in my room like <laughs> number five Splatoon 3 we'll see We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, that brings up an interesting point. We are halfway through the list currently. Number 10, we have Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Number 9, we have Colts of the Lamb. Number 8, we have a tie with Marvel Snap and Vampire Survivors. Number 7, Immortality. And number 6, Neon White. Now, uh, before we do a, a quick uh, sponsor read, Mike, you've been suspiciously quiet at this table. Yeah. yeah. Where, where, where are you at so far? What do you at? Are any of these oh, games on Halo your list? Infinite? Oh, <laughs> I can't wait for to hopefully see some of my games on this top five list, but also at the end when we talk about games that missed the list, I have a lot of games, and the best part about Kind of Funny is we all vibe with different things, and I have a lot of games that are near and dear to my heart this year, and I'm just dying to talk about. We'll, we'll so. get to I'll all the honorable mentions and I'll things at the, at the end of it, but yeah, I just, just wanted to, to, to ask you, so none of these games have been on your list so far? Uh, none of those okay. games have been on my list at all. We'll get no. to Shredders. We'll get what to Shredders. Well, yeah, we'll get to Shredders. We'll, 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 we'll save that. Year. We'll save that. Um, but hey, remember everyone, normally the Kind of Funny Games cast happens <laughs> each and every week. Uh, you can watch on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games or podcast services. And you can go to Patreon.com slash Kind of Funny to watch the show live as we record it and get it ad free. But for everyone else, here's a word from our sponsor. Shout out to Honey for sponsoring this episode. Honey's the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past, and we all know there's nothing better than the feeling of saving money. Honey's the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Here's how it works. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite websites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site, and if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. We here at Kind of Funny have been using Honey for years, and it has literally saved us thousands of dollars on tech, costumes, food, you name it. Honestly, I just love how easy it is to just set and forget and save. Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out, and by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash kinda funny. That's joinhoney.com slash kinda funny. And we're back, everybody. This is kind of funny's game of the year, 2022. I told Andy there was no way. This is why I thought I was faster than him. I didn't uh-huh. think he's like, I was I'm gonna run back to the race. Run to the bathroom and get back here. There's no way Andy no, could no do way. it. But that's okay. We just hang out and talk. Paris, how how's it been hanging out here in the spare bedroom? Oh, it's fantastic. This is my second time here, and you know, to be able to be on this panel talking about game of the year, this is great. Love Get it. it. It's been good. It's been good. Um, I'm still kind of loading in, in a sense, uh, coming off of not a lot of sleep, but mm-hmm. it's always mm-hmm. fun to be back in the studio. And I'm excited to be here because while I was here for the opening, we didn't do like our formal traditional right. content, yeah. other than like a few like pockets, like Blessing Show and stuff like that. Um, but being here and getting to like see people and talk to them in turn, it's just like, and I'm so glad I was able to make it because I'm like, oh, please don't, don't make them just put me on the screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to be I'm in so the chair. Happy. Yeah, this is really exciting, Andy. Welcome back. Andy, Thank what's you. it like being on the set? Shut the fuck up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to Fever the dream. next video game, the top half of our top ten. This is where it gets spicy. I'm scared. Horizon Forbidden All right, West. Uh, wow. More than I thought I'd get. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'll take it. Let's see. Is there a tie? <laughs> I'm always I scared now. <laughs> But at this point, I'll take one. Just get my boy Kirby on the list. You know what I mean? But uh, here we go, Janet. Hit us off. Number one, Horizon Defender. Even though I shouldn't need to defend this game, it's a fantastic video game. There you go. Horizon Forbidden West. Um, Sequel to um, the Horizon Zero Dawn. It is definitely an iterative sequel. But one thing that I really liked about this, like the two top things that I kind of recommend for this as a sequel, are how much more sci-fi and funky the story gets. Now that they kind of got rid of the just general set dressing, like intro to this character in this world, they were really able to do some really funky twists. Like, I don't think I ever could have told you what I thought this game would be uh, and have predicted that correctly, which I thought was very fun. 
Um, I love some good drama and storytelling. I think Horizon Forbidden West has that. On top of freaking fantastic gameplay, uh, I've seen it so much in the comments. Like, this game has robot animals. Why is it not higher on everyone's list? I don't know, because exactly. Like, it is so fun to go out there and hunt and strategize. And I think it has, like, a, a beautiful push and pull of if you are a more skilled player and want to go after those, like, stronger beasts and like really grind for like the apex predators and things you can do that but also if you just want to get to the story that's totally fair and fine and as usual it has like really strong quality of life updates so many of my complaints from zero dawn i think they fixed on this um so yeah i have like so many good things to say about this game it's so freaking fun to like run around that world and do the quests and like hone your skills hunting so much of that side content is very quality they brought back all these wonderful characters that you met in the last game um there's just some fun vistas. I think it does vistas really well with seeing iconography that you recognize from the real world. Now they're going to the West. Like when we hit Vegas, like, come on, this game <laughs> freaking rocks. Um, I love it. I think I had it as my number two of the year. So I'm like, it's gotta be here somewhere. But then I was looking at the numbers and I'm like, <laughs> do we have someone that only, am I the only one? Like I wasn't sure about that. So if you put this on your list, please Back me up on this. This game rocks. Oh, I'll 100% back you up. I had it at number five, ironically enough, on my list. Uh, just one of my favorite games of the year. I, every time I jumped into that world and started playing, I just adored it. Um, I think from a visual standpoint, it's one of the, the prettiest games that you'll see this year. Um, just going out into the open world, like you're saying, as, as you kind of level up your, your own skill set for hunting some of the, you know, the more dangerous uh, robot animals out there in the world. Uh, was great. Uh, I thought the story was fine, personally. I, I loved it. I know I've seen some of the criticisms out there about it, but, you know, this this is Aloy's journey, and I, this is the next step of it, and obviously, you know, it's going to continue beyond this, but I, I had a fantastic time with it. I think, you know, when you look, to your point, when you look at some of the complaints that I had with Zero Dawn, they address those in here, and then even during our review, um, I appreciate how Gorilla kind of listened to the community because Aloy was talking too much like kind of not letting us solve puzzles like oh well, you should try this why don't you try that and they've updated the game over the years i think even from a technical standpoint like there's the 40 frames per second mode now i i love it i i think it's great i i think it absolutely deserves to be in the top five and um i hope more people out there that are complaining go play it. <laughs> yeah for me it was uh number seven and for me horizon forbidden west is everything i want out of an iterative sequel you know, we talk a lot about like innovation versus versus iteration, right? And how like, oh man, you know, God of War 2018 felt like something we'd never seen before. How does the next God of War follow up, right? Is it going to be iterative or is it going to build everything again from the ground up? And for me, Horizon is a game that decided to take the formula of Horizon Zero Dawn and figure out what can we tweak here and there? How can we make parts of it look better? How can we take the learnings from our first game to make a better second game? And I think they did just that. Yeah. I'm somebody where... I played through Horizon Zero Dawn. I enjoyed it. It wasn't like anywhere near like my favorite open world game or, or my favorite PlayStation game, but it was a game that I enjoyed and a story that I thought was interesting and characters that I really enjoyed. Horizon Forbidden West for me did take the franchise to a new level just in terms of, all right, now how do we take those, those pieces and build something even way better? And for me, that comes down to the world they made with taking the American West and making spoilers and making that, <laughs> making that a setting that, feels interesting and feels like something you can get to know and you feel like you feel like you're playing a game this is gonna sound basic but stick with me that you feel like you're playing a game that is post zero dawn in the way that mm -hmm. zero dawn was shrouded in the mystery of what is going on what is the setting like what what's Aloy's story you're past that now and so i think it for me in horizon Forbidden west what they were able to do was answer a lot of questions or find interesting quests and interesting activities to do that are based off of the fact that you know that this is America, you know this is post-apocalyptic, you know exactly what it is. So finding old world ruins and it being like a, oh man, this is a broken down hotel, let me solve the puzzle of how to get the item that's located in here and getting bits and pieces of story lore through that I thought was, was interesting. Getting to visit locations like Vegas, like San Francisco and having the landmarks and having the world design reflect that in a way that I thought was Fun and interesting that stuff i loved the story not having to hold any secrets right it being able to be free and exposing the fact that like oh yeah all right like let's talk about it okay so this is post-apocalyptic all right like aloy's talking like talking to these characters that have formed societies has have formed cultures around the fact that this what this used to be a tech hub 
uh, stuff like that I thought was really fascinating and I thought made the story uh, really interesting, let alone improvements and additions made to the combat and your um, weapon set. Um, I like the combat more this time around. Like, there are very few things in Horizon Forbidden West that I would say aren't better than Horizon Zero Dawn. And so for me, that's why it made my top 10. Yeah, for me, it, this is exactly where I placed it. Number five on my list. Uh, I think everything that's been said about Forbidden West is spot on so far. It's it's an incredible game. It's a lot of fun to play. It looks great. There's great acting. There's all these cool things happening, yada, yada, yada. But the other thing that you come back to, I think, of why it's number five for us probably in overall and then the mixed reception it's getting in chat and stuff, right, is that it is that iterative sequel where it, was, it did not break the mold. And not every game needs to by any stretch of the imagination. I play games for fun, and I had a lot of fun with this. But it's one of those funs that there wasn't the lasting impact like for i feel like for me personally like i i had a great time with forbidden west i'm excited to go back and platinum when i do the dlc when it drops right but it's that idea of like zero dawn had similar to what andy was talking about i think with the twist of immortality had this big twist where it was like oh my god this uh, coffee cup drop kind of thing and forbidden west we already knew that so we live with that and yes they introduced some things that we eventually get to at the end but it didn't resonate the same way and it's the same way i think that this one struggles in the fact that it's and it, it's another one of those you have this delicious meal and then the last thing you eat is not great and that's what you remember from it that's why you and, skip dessert you know exactly <laughs> just, just walk away this story the final the story beat that ends aloy's narrative yeah. here is so like oh okay like I get that there's going to be a third game, but do we need to make this game really be like, it was all for this thing. Did, and did he have to say, see you in Horizon It's 3? in Horizon. Yeah. 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 God, Aloy all right. will like, return. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like, that was like, I think there's a few things like that that knock it into. It's like, uh, I have to stop. I really loved Regalia and what we did there. And it was cool getting Aloy's army together and having yeah. your hub base. And, you know, yes, obviously the Vegas was awesome. Vegas experience was awesome. Afterwards, exploring San Francisco, exploring the, 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 the with some of the things they give you at the very end of the game that i want to spoil like it's a great game that i really enjoy playing but like when we go through again for the t you know the games going up from you top four which are a lot of them are already up here right of snap or immortality and stuff like that it's not a game i think i'm ever going to think back on like oh man remember how great that was right. it'll be a thing of like oh yeah it was great but it's not like ah oh, man what a game i think it's the prettiest game this year um yeah. but i've mentioned it on other podcasts but like the fact that these npcs look better than so many other games main characters like everybody was given so much love like every character looks like a main character i think on the last podcast we i definitely sort of it, it i forgot about it but the vegas story the vegas mission is definitely like one of those best moments in gaming of the year my problem with it is that like the characters that you meet in there shouldn't be the most memorable characters in your game and like i just didn't have a whole lot of I just didn't meet a whole lot of memorable people in this game, and a, a lot of the NPCs that you meet just are kind of forgettable. But when I think of like the best moments of the year, the Vegas story is like probably one of the best in in gaming. Yeah, speaking on like why it wasn't higher than my number seven for me, I think it, it came down to a couple things. Greg talked about the the ending, and like there are certain story beats regarding some of the new characters in Horizon Forbidden West that I, uh, that didn't really land as well for me. And I still, to this day, I'm like, man, y'all seem like y'all were from a different game. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yeah. who brought y'all in here. And that's interesting. <laughs> like, it wasn't on my list. And, you know, we had the heated debate on uh, this game earlier the year on uh, Beyond and stuff. And I think I... I said, if this was on my top 10, then that means this was a disappointing year for games for me. That, the, <laughs> the, a damning review. Yeah, the sci-fi stuff near the end of the game was when it started getting interested, uh, interesting for me. And that's where I was like, where was this the entire game? Where was this the rest of the game? So that's interesting that you're kind of on the... I, I do get the frustration, though, where it's like, oh, well, could we have either just saved this for the third game? Or yeah. why, why is it such a cliffhanger weird thing? I think for me, it was if they... They ha they had it taken in one or two in one or uh, the other direction of build it out more and build it up more and and make it a thing that is a bit more integral and a bit more uh, present in the story or yeah just like save it like keep that for the third game or like not have it at all right like I think that the amount of that stuff you know if you played Horizon you know what we're talking about the amount of that stuff there was in that game I feel like just wasn't at the right measurement uh in that and that could have been could have been better but you know talking about again things that i did love the enemy design once again was fantastic the machine design like i would say in the way the way that um you know andy's talking about the characters being some of the best looking characters uh this year for me i'll say the enemy design in horizon Forbidden west was probably the second best for me after elden ring uh in terms of enemy design uh in a video game this year like fighting those machines this time around for me hit different 
um, you know, picking off those machine parts, changing weapons, yeah. figuring out like how to fight certain machines versus others. Um, for me, it hit really well uh, this this time around to the point where there was one clip I shared on Twitter that was from oh, I always get the mixed up. It was like either uh, Sun High Legend or one of the, the other accounts that does the really cool video game clips that I retweeted on my timeline a couple weeks ago. That was a uh, Horizon montage, and that was enough for me to go, oh, man, maybe I should pick up Horizon again. <laughs> I forgot how fun this game was when I was playing it. And it's crazy they copied you and I's idea, Blessing, of making it a multiplayer game. Like exactly. We got it. Like, <laughs> Blessing and I immediately text each other, and we're like, man, can you imagine like a Monster Hunter-style game like Horizon? And then what did they do, Sony? God damn. Yep. God damn. Oh, where's our money, you know? Where's the money, An Sony? One more thing that I, I, I wanted more, or I wanted out of Horizon that I feel like they built up and maybe I feel like in development they had to have stripped it out or something was speaking of the base. I swear to God, mm. like they built in some <laughs> companion system that was like a Mass Effect companion like uh, system where you're either I don't know if you're romancing them, but like they built the systems around that in the base and in the characters they introduce. And it yes. feels like right. somewhere along the line, they're like, oh, this isn't going to work or oh, we don't have enough time to do this. And so take it out. Um, I wish they went all the way with that. Oh, stuff. totally, right? Because, I mean, this back to what we're talking about again, like, of yeah, they listened and made Aloy quieter, but Aloy is still such a, for so many people, a bland character because yeah. we're yeah. meant to project on her. But then it does mean that I'd walk into that hub and I would stop and just listen to their conversations. Mm -hmm. And it feels like you're, like, the unpopular kid at school, even though you're the main <laughs> character of the game. I'm just, like, <laughs> eavesdropping on what they're talking about. They, like, they have music for the first time and they're listening to it. I'm like, oh, God, I want to hear this. But or, I'm like, not. when she's in that, like, tent and then, like, you know, like, her friends are outside and it's, like, they're kind of, like, macking on each other and she's just there, like, you know, and they're, like, she's, like, Siri, <laughs> Siri, play Marvin's Room. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say, like, obviously I love Horizon. I'm, like, the hottest one on Horizon here. But that doesn't mean that I'm not aware of like the ways the game is not, you know, masterpiece level. I definitely think this is like an eight, maybe pushing a nine, depending on who you ask. Um, and, you know, I think it's a lot of the stuff we've talked about on PS I Love You at length, like Aloy being too bland, not having enough emotion there, like them kind of not taking in the, I think the nuance of story, like the plot is cool, but when it comes down to like the moment to moment conversations and dialogue, it's like, how could that maybe souped up? And I'm, you know, sh I'm sure people will argue, well, it's like a weird era and, you know, she was isolated. You know, there's plenty of reasons to justify the tone. But for me, when I think of what I want to see from it next, I think those are the kind of things that could elevate it above. Um, and kind of just the last, like, quick compliment I want to pay the game is I like that they have so many, obviously, mechanics that we know from the first one, but they kind of do, like, a light little twist. It's definitely giving, like... Um, you know, Pepsi with lime kind of thing, or like, I don't, does, do they have fucking Pepsi with lime? I don't even fucking know, like, but whatever. Yeah. Nobody's like, your expense. You, you know, you know nobody knows. I don't know. <laughs> and I, would say hot, I would say hot Cheetos with lime, but that's kind of the weaker one. You're better off just putting the lime on yourself. Y'all get what I'm trying yeah. to say, the metaphor I'm laying down here, where they have like, you're getting the tall necks, but they made it like just a little bit different. Yeah. And yeah. I really like that. Um, it's not so different that it like totally, you know, loses the, I think, core idea, but it's different enough that, like, as someone that played the hell out of Horizon Zero Dawn pretty recently, Platinum that, I came here and I was like, oh, it's, like, it's a little bit different, and I really appreciate that the, aspect of it. The mission where the, or the activity, like, the side thing where they mixed a tall neck with a, um, Like a cauldron? The, the cauldron, yeah. Yeah, so oh, that was yeah. so cool. Oh, oh, and then you and get then you out, and it's, like, yeah, screenshot, was, screenshot, screenshot, yeah, screenshot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like, what I'm, like, that was, that's what I'm that was talking about when I'm talking about this game's open world design, is, like, there's so many ways in which it could have just been all right, here's your checklist game. And it like, it, for, it, it, it's, it is, right? It is like a checklist five. game. But right? it's like, it what if those games were five. good? That's the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's my thing is like, for me, I, I love Horizons open world better than pretty much any Ubisoft open world game, right? And I think it has, it has that level of creativity in it where it is as I'm going through. Again, the old world ruins really connect me to this world. The things like, yeah, the tall neck in the, in the cauldron really helped me feel like this, um, really helped me feel, feel like things are happening in the moment as opposed to me going, all right, where's this thing on the map? All right, let me go to it. All right, let me climb it the way I climb all these other things. Yeah. And having it be this yeah. very structured open world game, it has stru it's, it's structured, but in the way that there's a lot of flavor put in there as well, which is why I really enjoyed it. Also, the ruins are like legitimately challenging, which I feel like yeah. a lot of um, of these kind of games kind of shy away from having like too intriguing of a puzzle. No offense to most of the AAA games, like they, they kind of make them fairly like straightforward. These ones, like, I really had to, like, Stop, think and work around Put the controller down, it. look, span, right. spin yeah. around. Like, how do I get up there? And I know like, I need to get up they there. They were so fun to do. So, anyway. It would have made my top ten if the glider was good. Anyway, let's get to number four, everybody. <laughs> oh, That's wow. not. How dare you. <laughs> if I say, oh, we're going look to four? Look at you. <laughs> 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 you just ruined that. Can we wait? Yeah, see Can we pause? Yeah. Cool. Pair. No, I close it out. I, I've, I've overhyped this now, but I just simply wanted to say that, to me, Forbidden West cemented 
that I want more of this franchise and I want more of this world because that was the great thing about being able to play this game is like there's just so many mysteries and things that we still don't know sure. that I want to see more of. Well, take like, out a second yeah. mortgage and you can get PlayStation VR 2. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> All right. The final four. Let's get to it. Number four. Kirby. And the yes! Let's okay. go, baby! I'll wait for it. Here it comes to the us. <laughs> Oh, I'm so excited about this. This, this is number little guy. five on my list. Look at how good this game is. Greg, you were just saying that Horizon Forbidden West is a game that you was great, but you don't think you're going to be like talking about years to come all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kirby is the opposite to me, where I think Kirby is going to age so well with time, where people are going to look back fondly at it as like, wow, that was a truly special moment. Kirby has been a Nintendo franchise character for decades, but I think this really is the first time that we've seen that Nintendo love and care being put into it, being thrust into the limelight, this being one of the premier uh, Switch titles of the year. And I can't believe how quality the experience is. Love the music, love the vibe. of we, Last week on the Best Of show, we were talking about the aesthetic of the game and how they do such a good job being so cute and creepy at the same time, but never kind of going too far into the the creepy, but really like allowing the weird to enhance. What are you thinking of here? <laughs> like, you got something in your mind, and I'm dude, curious. I want mouthful mode, but also just like the the mm -hmm. look of it, where it's like it's it's a kind of sad apocalyptic world that he's okay. in Glass in this in forgotten there. land. But like, yeah, the Last of Us Kirby thing, we saw the trailer and it was like, whoa, this is very, there's a juxtaposition here that like doesn't add up for a Kirby. The game makes it add up. Like you get to these boss fights and they're bizarre. And it's, it, there's a weirdness to the game that I think really enhances it. And my God, we, we've talked about uh, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet having an amazing final couple hours. The final couple hours of Kirby is just the most unexpected but great gameplay experience that I, I think that I've had this year where uh, oftentimes we talk about how we hate when final bosses just switch everything up. This game doesn't do that. It just takes everything that you've learned and like turns it up to a thousand in the most incredibly bizarre way. Like bizarre is the only way I can put it, but they, they totally nailed the tone. And um, I, I hope that we, I know we will get more Kirby's like this because it performs super well uh, and it's very well deserved. Kirby in the Forgotten Land is something that people should not forget. Well, I just want to, I was going to say, I want to get, I don't know if you're the same for because I'm cracking up. Like, shout out to Andy and Barrett for all the graphics work and all this stuff. I just love looking down here at the 10th <laughs> dude. Look at four. Look at Kirby's I dumb can't, ass. I can't <laughs> you not use Carby, you know? Like, it's so <laughs> dumb and good. I was going to say, like, looking at 10 through 4, at the beginning of the of last year, would you believe that this was our top 10? <laughs> yeah. Like, this is Kirby being above Horizon is insane, but I also, I believe it. it. I've considered it. Yeah. I have considered it. Um, like, I have this at my three, so I have it behind Horizon, but I think there's totally an argument to make that it is better than Horizon because that's how good of a game it is. Like, I don't know if I have... No I don't have many notes for Kirby the Forgotten Land. It's... It totally nails... Okay, so here's the thing. What's fun about Kirby is, like, seeing the transformations, enjoying the transformations, and also enjoying the next level exploration if you're going for a slightly more completionist run. Because the number one complaint you hear about Kirby, and they're like... Who cares? He's walking around. It's super easy. It is easy, but it's as easy as you want it to be. If you go for some of those like extra collectibles and then let alone the freaking challenge levels in this game, like we talked a lot about, you know, some of these games scratching that itch of like going in, having a challenge, having it be timed. Like those challenge levels were legitimately challenging. I had to think about how am I using my ability? Where am I going? How am I running? And then that helped unlock more stuff. Um, the only thing I think I would have wanted from this game was more stuff at the home base. Like you can do like the mm. cooking mini game and like fishing, but I felt like I wanted a little bit more to that. But I think this is probably the best Kirby game since Kirby Planet Robobot. Um, I don't know where these, oh, yeah. this kind of stacks up for you, Tim. But oh, it's number one. This yeah. is clearly number one. Like this is like now the pinnacle of like what Kirby is at his best because I ain't going front. Some of them Kirby games, they're not good. <laughs> like it's, it's been an, a mixed series in some ways, but it. I always still come back to it because it's just so enjoyable. I think the mouthful mode totally looked very kind of gimmicky when we first saw it. But like when you f inhale that vending machine mm. and you start <laughs> shooting cans at people, come on. If that doesn't do something for you, we're just different players. Like I got nothing else to say. Because like for me, that's like the pinnacle of some of the most fun you can have in it. Um, and also shout out to the upgrade system. It was so, so good, good, so well done. Kirby can have a gun and then you upgrade it and he has two guns. Two like, guns. Oh, come on, yeah. come on. <laughs> Well, I'm excited. We need, yeah, we need to let Mike turn. speak. <laughs> because many of you don't know, 
Kirby's my third game on the list. Go. Top three, y'all. Uh, it's funny because starting the year, I made the joke. I thought Kirby was only from Smash Bros. And so this is very special to me to jump into this franchise and fall in love with it, right? Like, very rarely do I turn on this Nintendo Switch as it continues to show its age later on in this generation, right? Compared to its other consoles in the in the home living room. And man, oh man, when Nintendo hits, Nintendo hits, right? And they delivered on Kirby. It is so much fun. The music is bumping. The gameplay is simple yet fun and you can get in depth with it like Janet said, right? Like all of a sudden I'm upgrading my different forms and I'm loving what I'm doing. I go back to home base and I'm putting little quarters in the quarter machine hoping for a bubble to pop out with something cool. Like, I loved every moment of Kirby. I was Swiping blown away by it. I would get, <laughs> yo, Nintendo, I'll give you $20 right now for DLC or whatever you want. But for real, Kirby was something special for me this year and it, you know, these are those Nintendo games that pull me into the Switch and say, yeah, this is why I love what they do. When they hit, they hit, and Kirby delivered on everything that I needed in 2022. A, a complete surprise for me. This is number five. Mm -hmm. uh, this is probably the only Kirby game I've ever played this much of, uh, and, and I, I beat it earlier in the year. Um, got to it a bit later, but yeah, I totally understand. I understood the hype as soon as I kind of got into it. The combat's great. Uh, mouthful mode stuff just, it reminds me a lot of the best parts of Mario Odyssey, throwing your little yeah, hat dude on all these different things and kind of becoming that and how that adds into game design and gameplay was just a lot of fun. The upgrade system was really, really great. And the boss fights were just like so much better than I could have imagined. Uh, they were challenging in a lot of points, which was a lot of fun. Having this dodge mechanic was a blast. Um, yeah, the game just kicked ass, dude. And one of those big snubs that we talked about when, when the Game Awards were kind of revealed and we're like, where, why isn't this for best soundtrack? Like, every mm. track fucking bangs in this game. And yeah, the game rules, man. Oh, game. Okay. And then when I was sucking up the stairs, Dan, and I became the stairs, yeah, and I was going yeah, this like, way, that way. God damn, yeah. that was fun. And they had like, yeah. that cute little puzzle with it, too. Like, again, there were so many smart uses of the copy abilities and that's really what like ends up setting these games apart because again at the end of the day like going generally left to right forward into the thing like it's not hard to get through it for the most part but even to that note like some of those bosses i remember the i forgot which boss it was but it was when the I, armadillo yes yes mm. when i first died i was like and then it was funny because i was streaming it i'm like oh my god people are gonna think i'm so bad at video <laughs> games i'm dying at this kirby game but it's like no you pick up your sticks and tell me that it was not challenging like and then to tim's point for the ending like, it really elevated. And not even just, like, the last fight or the last stage. Like, that whole kind of area. Like, it was really a greatest hits of what was a great video game. And it was funny playing this after, you know, seeing, like, Tim's review over here. And he gave it a 5 out of 5. And, like, as I was playing it, I'm like, I don't know if this is a 5. I don't know if I'd go 5 out of 5. And then when I got there, I'm like, oh, I'd so go 5 out of 5. Yeah. Like, it's so clearly such a phenomenal video game um, with how they kind of package it all together. And it's, like a celebration of everything that's come before and then it gets all like resident evilly and then kind of like you're you know kirby you always like fight god at the end basically and they just do some really <laughs> bonkers stuff with that ending um and again even those levels leading up before i thought were so masterfully crafted for me it was uh, i was with you where i thought it was i was this is a four out of five like this game is great but like i don't know if i'd give it a five and it was that armadillo boss fight when i first did the perfect time dodge roll and it went slow-mo where i'm like this is a five. This is a five out of five. This game is so fun, and the upgrades and stuff are so well paced that I want to keep going. I hundred percent of this game, and I feel like this game only gets better after beating it. Yeah. Like I think that all the extra challenge stuff is like perfectly well done. There's the right amount of it. Like I feel like with the Nintendo games, sometimes their post game stuff can be too much, where it's just like here's just a bazillion things to do. This like kept it kept it tight, kept it fun, and it was such a great experience. Yeah, Janet mentioned earlier that like Kirby games can a lot of the time be eh, right? Like they they don't necessarily stand out so uh, a lot of the time. But this is for me probably the first Kirby game where I'd legitimately say I love this game. Like I was I was blown away playing this game, and it's it's funny because when they first showed it off, it was it, it, there were so many question marks in terms of like all right, yeah, this looks weird. Okay, this looks like Kirby in The Last of Us. Like, what is going on in this thing? And I remember doing the our fantasy draft at the beginning of the year and me just, like, not knowing what to, like, expect from Kirby. Just because Kirby, historically, I just, I've never I've never cared about Kirby, right? I've, al I've always been fascinated by the art styles of Kirby because I always, I always, I've always thought that Kirby is a very cute-looking game. Like, I like Kirby, uh, Kirby's epic yarn and how yeah, that yeah. looked, right? Like, the Game Boy Kirby's. I thought, I always thought Kirby had, like, a fun style to it, but... Whenever I would try out Kirby gameplay, I'd always just, I'd not off, right? It, it was never a thing for me. Uh, this game figured out gameplay in a way that 
surprised me and uh, blew me blew me away. But also from a, the art style perspective, like goddamn, going through the the abandoned mall and like it legitimately having this style I've not really seen from Nintendo, right? And like really uh capturing Kirby is like this, you know, cute little ball creature that is usually just like, you know, hanging out in grassy plains and all, like <laughs> saying be, hi to people, saying hi to people, right? And like these traditional platforming environments. The fact that like they put him in this fucked up mall and like he's like, <laughs> he's he he's still doing his thing as Kirby. Like stylistically, there's just th th this like I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like this separation of where you think Kirby would be and where he actually is that really hit well because they totally sold it. Like when you're on the out when you're on the outside walking into it, and it has like. This cool camera angle. I remember being like, "Oh shit! All right, some shit's about to go down. This is really cool." Let alone, yeah, the cool, the the boss fights, them actually being demanding in moments. Uh, yeah, shout out to Kirby. The day to day moment of him just being. So can I just say, I've not played Kirby, but when it was announced at number three, the excitement from this man. <laughs> <laughs> he finally his, gets to talk about it. His energy <laughs> is just radiating right now. To the point where I, I think I do need to check this out. You got it, sure. man. Check got it out. It. You definitely should. And I hope that this is kind of where we see Kirby games go from here on out. I hope this oh, is yeah. like the, they found the formula. They found something that legitimately works so, so well. And I hope that they keep on using that from here on out. All right. Let's get to the next one. Oh, boy. Here we go. Number three. Sifu. There it is. Wow. There's my guy. There it is. <laughs> John Sifu. <laughs> <laughs> Let's kick us off with this one. I mean, what a goddamn game, right? <laughs> like, it's very rare that you, that you start off a year with a game where you're like, oh, this is going to be my game of the year top three, like, easily. Yeah. I remember playing Sifu, and, you know, I te I immediately texted the, I think it was the Gamescast Slack, where I was like, y'all, you guys, you guys got to check this game out. Like, it is it is surprising how how good this video game is. Like it was for me, it was so good that if I got to rewind to last year, I would have put it on my high on my game of the year list for 2021. Let alone where it's at here in, in the 2022 list. This was my number. I want to say it was my number three. Is also your wallpaper? Like no, that's me. Oh, that, it is your number three. Bless. <laughs> it's my that's number just three. That's just me. Yeah, <laughs> but it looks like Sifu. Um, Sifu gets so much right. Uh, I think starting from the actual gameplay and the combat itself, they made a beat em up so satisfying just in terms of the animations in terms of the different combos you can unlock in terms of the progression i really like the format of hey you have five levels just play through the levels but you can't age out right every time you die you uh you gain age and if you age past a certain limit that means like it's game over right and so like you have to get good at these levels you have to figure out all right how am i going to get out of level one at age 24 how am i going to get out of level two at age 30 and it allows you to really take ownership of the pace in which you want to play the game and really make the decision for yourself of all right how confident do i feel um and it's a game that i think is is so well designed from a um room to room enemy enemy design and enemy placement standpoint and like room room environment design standpoint of you are going through these levels over and over again but you walk into a room and you know exactly what your strategy is. As soon as I get into that first room in the club, I know that I am throwing a those bat. Those motherfuckers are fucked, Yeah, man. those motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm tripping this guy. I'm throwing a bat at that guy. I'm, like, kicking a stool at this other guy. And I, I know my exact strategy because I've gone through it over and over again, right? And, like, for me, that's the magic of Sifu is, that, uh, is getting better with the repetition and the repetition never feeling um, boring, right? Isn't it? I never got bored by replaying these levels over and over again to the point where, what, late in February, March, um, we did the seafood race because all, what, me, Seriously, Andy... Seriously, one of the coolest pieces of content that yeah. we ever did. Like, it, 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 was, it was really cool, and it was really fun for the fact that all of us got so into the game that we memorized, like, we memorized the levels to the game to the point where we could all beat that game in under an hour. And this is a game that took me what, 10 hours to beat? Something like that originally, and now I'm just skating through this game. And for me, that's the power of Sifu, is the, fa <clears throat> is the fact that it really it really supports you getting better at it, and it's so fun and so satisfying to get better at the game. Um, and, I mean, aside from that, you know, art style, um, presentation, I, like, the environment design, again, like, so much of it is it, so good. It was number two on my list, and that surprised the hell out of me, because, like, this game, when it first came out, when everything you just said... The text with you, the phone calls with you, me being like, I don't think I could beat this first level, man. Like, this boss is kicking my ass. And then calling you be like, yo, I did it. I got to the second level. And then be like, I don't know if I can beat the second level. Rinse and repeat for every of the five levels. And here I am. I now platinum the game. Absolutely had 
the greatest time with this from beginning to end. I feel like any criticism I have of the game itself is all just small quality of life things of, um, I wish that we could have kept some of the upgrades sooner. And I wish that like, I didn't feel like I needed to grind to kind of get enough points to unlock this, that, and whatever. Cause once you get the full move set, the game really sings. And um, the, the amount of moments that we could even talk about of like, we keep bringing up the museum, which I think is one of the greatest video game levels ever. It's just so creative and so beautiful and just so fun to, to experience for the thousandth time. And you will experience it for the thousandth time because you have to play these things over and over. You bring it up the club uh, opening. I love that moment. I feel like yep. it's such a great shared experience that we all have of that was the perfect moment that I think most people got to because they, they they stuck with it to at least get through the first level. You get to that second and you had to replay that over and over. So we all had that muscle memory of here's how I do it. And everyone was like, oh, I know exactly what that that looks like. And that is that's rare these days for all of us to have that exact same thing that reminds me back to like the arcade days, the arcade days or like elementary school talking to your friends about how'd you do this and like you get that story to get that in 2022 i thought was a, a very special thing especially for a game as ridiculously difficult uh for me at least as it was to get better at it and now feel like i got it like i, I even this weekend i was like i want to i want to like get back into this before we play and i was like damn this this game is really special, and I'm going to be thinking about it for a long, long time. Can't wait for the arenas update to come out. Not exactly what I want from DLC from this, but I will literally take anything for it. Yeah, putting together footage for for what you all are seeing today, I was just reminded of like how happy I am that we were so stoked and hyped up on this game, and we just saw a bunch of trailers, and then. And not only delivered, but just completely over-delivered on, on everything. Um, because we knew it was going to be a really neat fighting game uh, because Slow Clap kind of has that history. How dare you, How dare you, call, <laughs> you call it a fighting game? <laughs> we, knew it was, we knew it was gonna have like awesome combat mechanics and then it not only delivered that, but uh, amazing aesthetics, like sound, visuals, getting every level kind of introducing weird, um, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but like it's never really what it seems on the surface whenever you enter a level. Things always change in really dramatic and cool ways. Um, yeah, this game just continuously got better, and it's one that I've thought about since we played it. Like, I just can't stop thinking about this game. And yeah, it was really nice memories putting together these trailers and these these things and just going like, God damn, Sifu was so fucking good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had it at my number three as well. And number two on mine. Uh, similar with a Neon White, right, where it's like it, your first run through, you you have a basic understanding of what's going on, and then the more time you put into it, the more understanding you have of how to fight certain enemies, the layouts of levels, shortcuts that maybe you want to take and risk because you know you you could get through it uh, through it, and maybe you can get through a certain enemy without dying like over and over again. Um, yeah, I absolutely uh, adored this game, and uh, similar to Tim, right, where it's like you beat the first level and your age like. I don't know, like 45 or something like that, you're like, all right, I survived. And then, like, getting the trophy for beating the game at age 20, I, for, I forget. 25 like, or under. It's 25 or under. That was, like, probably one of the hardest things I'll ever do in a video game ever. And, you know, just, yeah, something about the addiction to wanting to improve in that game. And, yeah, I also want to shout out to the... There's something about the last level that always stood out to me as well of how different and quiet it feels compared to the yeah. rest of the game and how it really starts to feel uh, cinematic in a more traditional sense in that last level that I absolutely adore. Um, and yeah, I, this will want, this will be one that I go back to every once in a while just to see if I can have the, the same skill set that I did when we got really into it. There's so many moments for me in this game that I find memorable too. Like the first time where... I hit the age limit. It must have been on the second or third level where I died. It was definitely the second level. I, it was in the second level where I died, and it kicked me all the way back, and I was like, oh, wait. Like, I... Wait, really? Like, I have to beat this whole game at under age eight? Uh, that's impossible. Like, going from that's impossible to, oh, no, I'm going to kick everybody's ass in this video yeah. game, for me, was, was such a good good progression. But then also moments like, again, doing our, um, our Sifu race, right, and it being the four of us, and getting to the the third boss and me never beating that boss in one go ever right and like knowing that oh i'm gonna get my ass beat at least a couple of times to this boss but i'm just gonna keep going and then uh getting to that boss and then beating it on my first try and the pop from like 
oh shit, I can't believe I actually did it, right? And I did it in this race with like stakes and like, yeah, seafood for me is just such a, a, a special game for all of, all of the moments that it, it can create, both like in the game itself, but then outside the game, right? For you just as a player. One of my favorite moments in that in that race is uh, you, me, and Andy all finishing it within like a minute, a of, minute each, of each other. Uh, of mm -hmm. each other, which was like absolutely, I, I think even less than that too. I think it might've been somewhere in like the 30 second range. And it was just like, God damn. We're fucking gamers, Andy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, we are a whole bunch of gamers here, and we are at our final two, which, of course, is going to reveal what number one is. We're going to talk about scoring, number maybe. two first, and then we'll talk about number one. Deal okay, everybody? Sure. Because we don't know what's getting in here, but hey. we, we, we have some ideas on what might be revealed. Barrett, hit it. Number two, Elden Ring. Oh. <laughs> well, there we go. Andy, pick us off. The times are changing it kind of funny. This is like when Texas is starting to lean more and more blue over time. Not quite yet, but we're getting there, baby. I don't there, like baby. what you're implying. <laughs> we're getting, we are getting there. Um, my God, dude. Just no game has stuck with me like Elden Ring did. Um, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about the changes. I knew that getting a Breath of the Wild style Dark Souls game um, was going to be a big change. And how, how are they going to, how is From Software going to make this work? And God damn, like we're talking like 10 plus moments where you're, where you're constantly kind of blown away by what's being revealed to you. The map is getting larger. You're hitting more and more new areas you didn't even know existed. And suddenly there's a whole underground area and you're mind blown by that. And you go, wait, there is the, the, with this more underground areas and the game just keeps on progressing and getting better and better as it keeps going. Um, yeah, no game has stuck with me like Elden Ring. I'm still playing Elden Ring to this day, but I think like 200 hours on Steam and about 130 hours on Xbox. Um, two different playthroughs, having a blast with all of them. We want to play more of it with this new PC mod that allows you to play seamlessly. Uh, Co-op, me, Mike, and Nick want to get into that. Um, yeah, dude, From Software just killed it in every facet. They they made the game a bit more approachable with all of the um, spirits you could summon to help you out. Uh, they made the game a little bit better co-op, not like all the way like we'd like it to, like we'd expect from modern games um, nowadays with how easy co-op is, but um, still, like they just, they killed it. They did everything that they needed to and there's just so much shit to do and see. No game has ever sparked my imagination like Elden Ring has. Yeah, and uh, to bounce off really quick, Andy, of like the, the times are the change and stuff like that, like imagine three years ago for 2019, kind of funny game of the year, and Elden, if Elden Ring came out in 2019, it wouldn't have even been talked about think about that right like Sekiro came out that year and I don't even think it was on kind of funny as like official top five or whatever we did that year so the fact that it's we gotta reboot 2019 two, you know? like, I feel like now Sekiro might be number one <laughs> in 2019 is kind of funny but yeah for me El Elden Ring was number one uh, and for me that comes down to the fact that I don't understand how El Elden Ring exists uh getting to uh, again we talked we talked about this last week we talk about it all the time with Elden Ring but those fallout coming out of the vault moments where it is you walk out and you see a vista and it's like I can go anywhere and the, um, one of the first ones in that in, in Elden Ring after you beat the first big boss, right? You step out, and I remember looking across and being like, "Oh my god! Like this is the open world? Oh shit! Here we go!" And that was nothing. <laughs> like that was just twenty percent. That was just part of the open world, right? But then you do you do things like yeah, you go underground, and I'm like, "Wow, this is this elevator taking a while." And seeing what the game has to reveal to you, it's like, "Oh my goodness!" Let alone the other times where you look across the vista, and it's like, "Oh man, yeah, there's way more to this." There's there are so many dope looking environments in Elden Ring in a way where I'm like, again, how the fuck does this game exist? Once you get to, um, I guess I should, I, I don't want to spoil things, but once you get to a, like, there's a place where there's a lot of dragons is what I'll say. And <laughs> upon getting there for the first time, legitimately, I was blown away just by what I was seeing on screen. And I'm, I'm somebody who, you know, there, are, there are a lot of different things about video games that I love, right? I love combat. I love, I love gameplay. I love story. I love like, I, I love many things. I've never really thought about just like, visual design in terms of moment to moment i can look anywhere in elden ring and i can frame it and put it on a wall like that is 
for me how good the a lot of the visual design and the art direction of Elden Ring is. Um, and I can like visualize like so many different areas just by like the, uh, like my first time getting to Kaled and seeing the entire shift and how the sky looks in the shades of red. Right, going to uh, the um, what's the big area with like the castle that's like end game area. Hitting that place, Lindell. Before, like, Lind yeah, getting to Lindell and like seeing how that place looks. Like there are so many distinct locations that all shine so bright. Let alone, again, going back to uh, exploration and discovery and how well the open world is designed from a enemy encounter standpoint from a, all right, let's put this race of enemies over here and, like, you know, put, like, dragons up here. Uh, like, uh, so much of it is so well designed, so good, and so satisfying to actually explore and run into. And the exploration actually feels like true exploration. Like, this is the type of open world, open world game that I prefer the most, where it is go any direction and you are running into things that are you know fascinating things that you can get into i'm the the first time i i booted up elden ring by myself after we did our first let's play i went I remember going south and i ran into like this like small castle and dungeony area and i got to the the boss of it and the boss is like this werewolf dude that was kicking my ass and i remember texting andy and i was like yo like have you fought this guy like am i supposed to be here like what's going on and andy's like i've not even been to that part of the map yet like i did not go south you should go north like go north um but being able to have moments like that where it is me going in whatever direction I want and finding something that I can actually like I, I can actually play with. Right. Something I can actually fight and get some sort of satisfaction out of. I thought um, for me, I, I thought worked super well. Um, then you talk about the amount of bosses and you talk about like, God, the, dra the dragons in Elden Ring are the best dragons I've ever seen in a video game. Like, it's insane how good these, <laughs> these dragons look. You played Mario Odyssey. <laughs> and I played Mario Odyssey, mm -hmm. but, like, the dra it, goes, it goes Elden Ring, it goes God of War, and it goes Mario Odyssey for dragons. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, there aren't enough good things I can say about Elden Ring. Yeah, we can keep the good things going because Elden Ring is my number one. I mean, 115 hours in, and I never want it to stop. As someone who's played Dark Souls 1 all the way through the collection, right, like, this is a very special franchise and to see how they continue to iterate on it and evolve it and make it bigger and grander, right? We talk about that open world moment, right? And seeing the vistas as we've brought up with different games, like Elden Ring nails all of that. And the co-op gameplay is so much fun, right? I've played each and every one of these games co-op and to be able to share these moments with friends, to overcome the challenges and share those triumphs with friends is a huge thing for me. Like I love that aspect of it all. And of course, teasing Andy while taking photos and making him fight the bosses for me is always a blast, right? But like seeing what this team has done to elevate the gameplay and evolve on these bosses and the enemies that we know and take you to different areas that are so grand and going, wow, look at the level design, right? Andy's like, Mike, you got to go left. Now jump over this bridge. You're going to fall 20 feet, but you're going to make it. Don't worry. Now hop over here, jump through this hole. Bang, we're at a brand new area. Like, Every time they deliver on that and FromSoft continues to make me smile and make me go, man, I love playing these games. Even when I'm banging my head against the wall, fighting Melania for the <laughs> eighth hour in a row, right? Like that's what I'm all about when it comes to challenges. And it's cool to see Sifu up here. Cause like, I like these challenging games. I like to see those games come out in the forefront and say, Hey, you're going to beat, you're going to get beat up here, but you can do it and you will do it and you'll figure it out and you'll go on to the next one and go, Oh man, I did that. And now I'm going to go beat up another one, you know? And so I, I'm blown away with Elden Ring. The music, the visuals, the gameplay, all smacked. Dude, it is a top game for sure. The, the builds also. Yeah. Like, well, I didn't realize it until I, the game was out for everybody. And I started to go on TikTok and seeing just the, the most insane builds that people made, right? Like somebody made Goku in the game. Another mm -hmm. person made a Will Smith build where you go around slapping people. Like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy the, like the different things that people made in the game in order to like role play and have fun, but also like the legit builds that you can make to, to, allow, uh, to account for your own play style. And once I understood that aspect of it, and once I made a build that was like, all right, I'm going for blood. I have, my, mm -hmm. I have two katanas. One of them is a blood katana. The other one, I believe, was like the regular uh, Uchi katana, but then I also had the the um like the flash step where you can like you know do your your the bloodhound uh, step yeah yeah the, yeah the blood step where it's like you know you're doing like you're your almost like yeah. your goku instantaneous uh transmission kind of thing uh god that game started to sing for me in terms of combat two more quick things the storytelling right like you can be andy cortez and be deep in the weeds and like listen to all the lore videos and really go deep or you can just be a casual player and just be wowed by like the story that's being put in front of you and being lost and like 
oh man, I saw this character on a random blog who was like, yo, you got to go to the castle to tell my daddy that I need him. He's got to come back, right? And like, you go over there, you get to the castle and you're like, yo, Jabroni, your daughter's out there. Like, let's get over there. You show back up, shit has happened, right? Like, yeah. they always do a great job with that. And then there's nothing better in video games for me right now, the feeling of being invaded and having that moment of like, oh snap, mm -hmm. somebody's in our world and they're going to try to ruin our gameplay. Andy, get ready, right? And then I force Andy to go fight the guy <laughs> while I look pretty in the background. But that's a cool feeling in video games. Reminds me of Sniper Elite 5, right? When we were playing Sniper Elite and all of a sudden you would be invaded and it's like, oh, get on your P's and Q's because you're about to battle someone in real life. Like, here we go. The idea of having that plus the, you know, the playable environment of enemies coming after you with that is such a cool mix of gameplay that like, you only get out of that, and it's so much fun to experience and to share with friends. Again, I play long co-op, and I love that, that you can do that in this kind of game. And, uh, yeah, speaking of getting into the world, my first playthrough, um, I, I wasn't, you know, as deep in the weeds like Andy uh, was or, or, or Bless even, stuff like that. But uh, listening to other people talk about it on spoiler cast and, like, uh, Waypoint Radio and stuff like that, and uh, them talking about, like, getting into character role-playing and stuff like that, of, like, who your character is and, like, involved in this world. And so I had started my New Game Plus uh, playthrough over the break, and uh, I decided because, you know, everything carries over, your OP as fuck, at least in the beginning, and so I decided that, like, you know, I'm gonna role play as, like, a guy who's essentially the one-punch man of this world, and we're gonna just, like, I'm just looking for the toughest fight ever, you know, mm -hmm. and I, like, so far, I've not died at a boss yet, and it's just, like, it's fun to exist in that world, and, yeah, it was really special for me for that game. It was my number five on uh, my personal list this year, um, is really that first third of it, and getting to explore the, the opening uh, areas, and, you know, going over to the after you beat uh, Margit, right, Andy, the, mm -hmm. the the first, like, big guy, and then uh, going past that castle, where it's like in any other game, that would have been, like, the final boss or something. And then it's like, no, we're going to keep going. And you're only, like, 10 of the way, 10% uh, of the way through this game. Uh, was really special for me. The The only thing that made it a little lower on my list, I, I, I think the, the last third of it, uh, where you get more... Uh, uh, away from the open world stuff that you really love in those first hours. And it, uh, to me at least, it felt like, all right, you're now you're just barreling through bosses and stuff like that. And that's when it became a little less interesting for me. But I still liked it enough that I was like, you know, fuck it. I'm, this is going to be my first Souls game that I ever, like, roll credits on and stuff. Because I've started up plenty before. Um, but this was the first one where, like, now, yeah, like, I think I'm almost 80 hours in uh, just playing it in, in general and already starting up a second playthrough. Uh, the, again, similar to having the it on the kind of funny year list, uh, the fact that it was even on my top 10, I, I think was like a, like, holy shit. Yeah, Where was it? Was, it was number five for me. Yeah, number one for me. I, I, I was so sad when there was nothing else left to do um, on my PC playthrough. Like, I just... I was like, there's got to be at least one more mini boss out there because you, you fight probably like a total of 150 bosses. Um, I, I think I just really enjoyed the role playing aspects of experiencing a story as opposed to like being told and shown a story, which is why I really just enjoyed this world. And this felt like the one where I, I, there's few things that I love more that Souls games have taught me in games than the conditional moments where if you happen to kill somebody and you go back and talk to so-and-so, they're going to have something new to say. They may not be the same person. They may want revenge. They may thank you. And you won't know that unless you go back to go and talk to them. And those are the things that I love the most where like, you're not going to get a cut. You're not going to like kill somebody and they get a cut scene of that person walking in and being like, wow, you killed that dude, huh? Like you always have to go back to see what these people have to think or these monsters think. Um, that's like the coolest shit in games to me where the, the stuff that won't happen unless you go and seek it out, I think is like easily my favorite thing. And Elden Ring delivers that in spades. It's such an awesome experience. Paris, was it on your list? So happy you asked. My number two. Oh! 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 Wow. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> So there had been a running joke throughout the year. First of all, I was like, I'm not playing this game. I'm, it's not my thing. I don't want to get into this at all. And we would talk about this on Xcast all the time. And I would hint to Mike and go, you know, I've been playing it, but I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, really yeah, yeah. Quietly just playing it. God, every week we try to get yeah. you to say something about that game. <laughs> but I mean, to, to sum up my thoughts on it really quick, 
this, it is easily one of the best games I've ever played. Um, just from the standpoint of the, the size, the scope, the visuals, the difficulty, I'm not good at Elden Ring. I'm just simply not. And I like that because that's what this game is supposed to be. It's supposed to challenge you. It's supposed to push you out into that world and to go explore. Like the fact that something like Blessing was saying, like he went south, I don't think I've gone south at all, you know, and I've already run into so many different challenges and things that um, I'll get mad and I put it down and then I come back to it later, but I have not completed Elden Ring and I think that's okay in the sense that it's one of those things that I knew going in it was going to challenge me, but I've I've had a blast with it. It's it is easily one of the best games. Oh yes. yes, that's awesome. Well, now it's time, everyone. Go for number one, scoring. <laughs> and the kind of funny game of the year is God of War Ragnarok. Yay! Yay! Yeah. Yeah. God of War Ragnarok. Greg Miller, keep us off with this one. Uh, I mean, this has been a two-horse race for, I think, even before either Elden Ring or God of War came out, really. This has been the conversation since we were in uh, 2021, talking about what was coming down and where we thought it was going to happen and would either of these games really come out, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it really is, a, you can't go wrong. I mean, obviously, with this top 10 list we've assembled, you can't go wrong with amazing games to play from 2022. And it really is, I think, come down to your personal preferences. And so, you know, God of War Ragnarok is shocking no one my game of the year. It's my number one on this list. And it's because I think I, I know it's a masterpiece. And it is doing what I love in video games. And what we were talking about, you know, how personal this list has been so far to this point. It's the same with the number one vote of, you know, I talk about Horizon earlier and how, it was a great game, obviously, but I don't know if I'll ever think back or if I'll ever call out a moment from it and yada, yada, yada. I, th I still think of God of War Ragnarok just about every day in some aspect. And granted, my life is talking about video games and doing it, but it is, you know, I still want to add to the Porty chat too at some point the, you know, uh, uh, to grieve deeply is to have love fully. Like, I still want to add that there. There's still those moments from this game that resonate that way. You know, I think we talk, again, to compare it to Horizon and be like, well, that's a game that iterated, right? Clearly, God of War Ragnarok has iterated as well, but I think it jumped so far out from what it was at 2018 with all of its systems, its scale, its animation. I mean, we're talking about God of War 2018 being a gorgeous, beautiful, fun-to-play game, and this is the 2022 version of that on such a different level to go back to not only having the bigger moments of having, you know, having Ragnarok, you know, fighting Odin, going in to do all this stuff to bring it into smaller things of I'll always, again, moments I'll remember the rest of my life from video games, the tent with the Kratos and Atreus the night before Ragnarok. And the, you know, I, I, I've been lucky enough to, uh, when I started doing up at noon and really started becoming in front of the camera, Greg Miller, right? it was right as voice acting was really taking off, right? Where it was, people knew who Troy were and it was, and they knew uh, uh, Dave from Walking Dead, right? And to have them come in, to see that scene in the tent and see, I honestly feel like for the first time ever, to see Christopher Judge playing Kratos. You know, it is not just his voice. It's not just them trying to make it look. It's the wrinkles in the forehead. It's the thing there. And it's not, Chris, because it is obviously all the animators at Sony Santa Monica. But it is this culmination of what I think makes video games the art form they are. Where you can see everyone individually touching this to make that moment happen. And not to mention that that moment doesn't matter if I'm not connected to God of, or to Kratos throughout this story. If I'm not enjoying playing this game. And to get back into, you know, oh, well, you know, oh, they learned so much with making Aloy be quieter here, right? Obviously, they learned a lot with making Atreus not so goddamn annoying. But also evolving those characters those relationships putting those moments in the gameplay as you play and the little experiences you have uh the way you interact with characters the way you brawl out there the way this kratos is truly different than the kratos we've ever seen before and again this is sounding like i'm just talking about stories and the narrative but that does go into gameplay and it does really i think influence how you play and you know getting the fucking spear and being on that beach right and being like, oh, you, you should know how to use that, right? Or, you know, Brock's like, you should know how to use that or whatever. He's like, it's the first weapon a, a Spartan's ever been trained with, right? It's what you get, learn from. Like, the fact that I popped for that in the moment, right? And, then you're like, da, 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 and you're fucking people up and you're using it. And it's, again, that Metroidvania to the world of this gorgeous open world you can explore. But this entire game, I've been seeing the fucking steam shoot out of the walls. I'm like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? And to finally get that, like... 
that is what God of War is moment after moment for me. It is that reward and that payback for this experience of even the games I didn't enjoy back in the day on PS2 or PS3 playing, right? To have that all pay off into this experience is just so incredible. It was uh, also my number one. And I'll tell you, it pained me to put it at number one because I feel like it's the easy answer for me for the type of games that I like. And I really wanted to rock for Sifu. Like, I really loved Sifu. It was such a special game to me. And I was like, God of War Ragnarok's going to have to wow the fuck out of me in order to be number one. And it wowed the fuck out of me. I feel like it is just such an accomplishment. We talk a lot about the, the story. We talk a lot about the technical side. We talk a lot about the gameplay. And to me, those are three of the most important elements of a video game. And they just do it so damn well. Again, looking at the list uh, that we have, what an incredible year for video games. But I wanted more God of War 2018, and they delivered that in spades. I've said this before, but there's Infinity War, there's Endgame, there's Last of Us 1, Last of Us 2, and then there's God of War 2018 and Ragnarok. I prefer the second of all three of those things. I love both of them so much, and I feel like uh, I can make an argument even against myself on why the first one's better or whatever. But the fact that Ragnarok can be in that same conversation of 2018, which is one of the most transformative games we've ever seen in terms of taking a... a I don't think we've ever seen a, a franchise that popular get reinvented that successfully. Um, I guess Zelda might be the only other example that can go that far. But for Ragnarok to up the ante so much while keeping everything contained, it feel, we use the word epic a lot for yeah. it. Like it, and it really uh, lives up to that where I love what they did with the story and the characters. And my favorite thing about the game is the the, the pairings and partnerships of the story of you're, you're this character with that character, and next thing, you're a completely different character with this person that, oh, I didn't expect them to, to hang mm -hmm. out. And I think that allowed the characters to have so much character to them, to really not just have a great plot, but to really make it about these, these characters that anytime I was with one, I was missing another one, but so happy yeah. to be with this one, excited yeah. to get to the next one. And I think that that all worked together to culminate an experience that narratively is is one of the best in video games, one of the most emotional. I cried multiple times in this game from hype and from just the emotion that they're they're trying to, to give to me. But then also that's just so damn fun. And it's just great, the, the combat and just moving around, switch between the weapons, like it feels good to play. And all of that's backed up with just being absolutely incredibly beautiful, sounding so good, having so many great options to play the way you want to play it it's a masterpiece yeah it is a masterpiece it, it was also my number one and and i think for me uh the the thing that really attracted it to, to make it my number one was the fact that i'm a father with a teenage son yeah. and i'm going through a lot of that shit like in real life that that you know that kratos is he turns going into through. a bear uh, yeah, 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 yeah you know <laughs> yeah. like oh yeah. no but but you get my point just the emotional aspects of it really drove home to me because I, I just related to it so much on that level. And and I think when I think Kratos and just his evolution as a character going from 2018 to where he ends up, obviously, by, by the end of Ragnarok resonates again with me as, as a father, you know, trying to relate to my son. And then, sure, the gameplay in it is great. But it's it's so funny, and this is a minor thing. It's not really a spoiler, but... The moment everything clicked for me, ironically enough, was a side quest story with the whale. I'll just leave it at that. But sure. the whale, sure. that was the thing. And I was like, God damn, <laughs> you know? And just from that moment on, everything, all the relationships, all the things that you interacted with till you get to that end. Yeah, I, like you, I was, I was just a hot mess playing the game the entire time. And yeah, just the 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 best story that I've played in 2022 was God of War Ragnarok for sure. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with that. I think too, just to like add on, obviously I pretty much echo everything everyone said about the story being amazing and like the, to Paris's point, the side quests in this game are so much better than so many games main quests. Like it, yes. it like flex it. And it's funny cause you know, I'm a big, again, big Horizon fan. It was high on my list, but like playing this game, I'm like, oh man, this is what Horizon you'd be doing. Cause it's like, it flexes on so many things that so many other games don't just quite nail quite the same. Um, something that really surprised me about this game too is like how it has widened its spectrum of emotion. Like I think God of War Ragnarok is so fascinating because it is, you know, we talked about the dichotomy between um, iterative and innovative that like Blessing point out earlier, it's both. Like it's totally iterative mechanically. Like, okay, I got my, you know, I got my ax and then, you know, you take the chains and you fucking whip it and you know, you know what you're doing right. as soon as you pick it up. Like I could have, you could throw me into Ragnarok at certain points and I, 
maybe wouldn't be able to tell that it's not 2018. And yet it feels so innovative in the context at which you approach that. I think the verticality they added to the level design with the arenas really went a long way for making it a little spicier. I think they did um, some cool things with difficulty where it's not quite like harder, like things are spongier, but just kind of the, the dynamics in which you're like working with the environment and working with the enemies that come at you. Um, the team has described this on the PlayStation blog as having a puzzle approach to combat. And while I don't feel that every time I'm in a fight, I definitely felt that in some of those like 2v1 or like, oh my God, there's a, an amazing side quest uh, where you're like heading to your boat and there's like this jump scare of like a creature coming out. And like, there's so many fun little surprises in this. And I was just really taken aback by the space it left for like a wider um, emotional variety. Like there's so much humor in this game. Like I laughed out loud playing this video game multiple times and that's something I wasn't expecting at all. There's a lot of like beauty to it. You know, the freaking jellyfish like side quest of like you all did that. Like where I don't even know if it's the main inside. It kind of all blurs <laughs> into just a fugue. But um, there's like things I've looked at in this game that were so beautiful. I was almost moved to tears just by how good it looked. And then right after that, it's like, okay, you're going to get ready for like a really satisfying, cool battle. Um, yeah, I absolutely adored this game. Like again, almost no notes. There's like little quiet moments. There's like an area that reminds me of it takes two. Like they did so many things with this. Um, and I just really, really enjoyed the overall experience. And I felt like, you know, with 2018 being such a masterpiece or at least verging on masterpiece, depending on who you ask, like this one was so clearly so much better when I was so doubtful, I think, like many of us, on how how much better could it even be? Right, sure. And they answered that so well, so detailed. Like, I have to give it to them. This is this was so easily my game of the year and probably one of the best games I've played across multiple years. Like, this is in that conversation for me of, like, when you think of decades or times or eras, like, this game's up there. Yeah, this was uh, my game of the year as well. And there's really nothing that I can add on that hasn't already been said, uh, said but... I will say, like, going back and playing through the original games for the first time uh, over the last few months, making that kind of recap study into Kratos' story and stuff, uh, Ragnarok really felt like, you know, is seeing a promise through of, like, what Kratos has always kind of been about as a character and where they decided to end his story was just... I don't know. There was nothing more satisfying to me this year than to be able to see his entire story play out from the very first original God of War and see yes. where he goes uh, through that original trilogy in the really cool PSP games that like <laughs> are definitely underrated uh, into 2018 into this. It was just, it was a, a culmination that I, I can't believe they pulled off and I, I, I love the, the game uh, so damn much. So yeah, easily game of the year for me. Mike. Yeah, this is my number two game of the year. I mean, hands down, you look at this as a product, as an experience, whatever you want to do, this is a great game, right? And I am always wowed whenever I turn on my PlayStation, which is very rare, and I play a PlayStation first party game, and I'm always blown away by what this team and what these teams are capable of, right? You look at God of War, the presentation is unbelievable, right? To look back when I was playing N64 games to where we are today, it's like, wow. We have come so far, and there are so many talented human beings making awesome experiences, right? What they did with God of War from way back in the day on PS2 to just hacking and slashing and mindlessly murdering and having sex with people to where we are today from 20, 2018 to now, it is a full 360 circle. Like, this is incredible, right? I cannot believe they made this guy Kratos so relatable and so wowing, too. I'm on every beat of this story, and I can't wait to see where it goes next, right? And adding Atreus more into the mix. And then the pop of color with Boda, right? Like that was one of those where you get to that moment, you're like, man, this is cool. Like this is a really cool connection that we're building, like what's going on? And then the moment she's like, hey, let me help you. And bang, throws out that pop of paint color mm. and it just splatters across the screen. And you go, oh my God, how do you continue to do this? And you go into the next world and it does that again. And like every time I get chills just talking about this game in particular, because it is so special. and Sony continues to put out products like that where I'm always wowed by what they're capable of and how I can get lost and blown away by it. it it's a blast. It is a great game. And Cortez, where was it on your list? There's number three on mine. Um, yeah, I mean, talk about amazing characters, amazing dialogue. I still prefer 2018's story of it being a little bit more self-contained. Um, but this game improved on everything that 2018 needed improvements on when we talk about gameplay and enemy variety. I feel like those are 
maybe two of the only weaknesses of 2018 and this game offers so many more things to hack and slash at um added puzzle elements um yeah i mean the the getting to play as different characters with different abilities i think just adds so much more to it and makes it like janet and blessing were saying like it it's iteration but it's innovation at the same time i think they just absolutely knocked it out of the park like this game could have only this game could have easily failed right this we're talking about like one of the best games of all time how do you follow up on that and they made another one of the best games of all time yeah for me it, it, it was my number four and <clears throat> to that to that same point right like it succeeded doing the thing that i i fear so much about like zelda tears of the kingdom where i'm like all right how's this game gonna live up to a game that i call one of my favorite games of all time and ragnarok did it and it did it by separating itself right like the drama the drama in the story in this game is so thick right like it's so good and uh Mike brought up Anger Boda earlier, and like Anger Boda is where I started to fall in love with this game because I think for me that started to expand the world of God of War, right? In a way where getting to uh, uh, the what's the, the place with Heimdall, the Asgard, Asgard. Thank you, thank you. Getting to getting to Asgard, I was like, shit, dude, this is a world, right? And like hanging out with Atreus. Spoilers for God of War. Hanging out with Atreus, and like we were way past yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, we, we really jumped the ship on that really quickly. Yeah, hanging out with Atreus and, like, meeting all these different characters in Asgard, I'm like, dude, I, I can live in this world. Like, this world is incredible. Uh, and, yeah, like, I, yeah, like, this game did it. Yeah. It did. It became kind of funny. It's Game of the Year 2022. Congratulations to Sony Santa Monica and everybody that had anything to do with this game. What a masterpiece. Uh, but that's our list. That's our top ten. I feel pretty damn good about it. That's a that oh, is yeah. a solid oh, list, very solid. representative of the taste here at Kind of Funny. Thank you all for hanging out with us and uh, enjoying those tastes to some degree. To want to listen to us talk for over two hours about this, but we're not quite done yet. Uh, Barrett, where do you want to go from here? Y'all ready for a breakdown? And I'm not talking about the mental one I have every once in a while. I'm talking about <laughs> stats and numbers and fun things like that. Honorable mentions, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Are y'all ready for that? Some yeah! fun number yeah. stuff. So first, I want to break down the top ten because uh, you know, obviously, people oh in, in our uh, in our community trying to break down like, oh, it's going to be Andy and Mike's number one, but what about uh, Greg and Tim's? Where are they going to put Marvel Snap and all that stuff? So I just want to do a quick point breakdown of the top ten first, uh, as a reminder for last year, right? Uh, it was a pretty like uh, evenly spread out for points wise, but then our top three. We're all within a point of each other. So last year, Deathloop got 40 points, Returnal got 41, and then Ratchet and Clank got 42. And then you get all the way down to uh, number 10, Hitman uh, had 15 points, kind of the barrier of entry there. Uh, and then for even greater context, right? By some miracle, if some game, if one game was on our number one for all of us, the most a game could get is 80 points. Uh, so with that said, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet came in at number 10 with 13 points. Cult of the Lamb came in at 14 points oh, uh, wow. with uh, number nine. So we're already seeing it's a little bit of an opposite story this year where it's very tight at the bottom of the list. And then we start to get a little bit more spread out. Marvel Snap and Vampire Survivors, 16 points coming in at number eight. Immortality had 17 points coming in at number seven. Wow. Neon White coming in with 19 Ooh. points at number six. And then we start to jump up a little bit here. Horizon Forbidden West came in with 25 points. Kirby and the Forgotten Land came in with 28 points. Sifu came in with 34 points. And Elden Ring came in with 45 points. Damn! So if Elden Ring came out last year, it would have easily been in our game of the year. Think about that, Andy. Think about that. Wow, eh? Yeah. God of War Ragnarok. For those wondering at home, how close of a race was it? None whatsoever. <laughs> Again, as a reminder, the most a game could get is 80 points. God of War Ragnarok was easily our game of the year with 74 points. Holy wow. shit. Wow. That's, that is wild. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> it is really good. Damn, that, that's, that's super fun. Uh, do you want to talk about some honorable mentions, uh, Barrett? Uh, really quick, uh, just uh, before we move on from the top 10, yeah, God of War, uh, like last year, was the one game that was on everybody's list. Uh, behind that, Elden Ring and Neon White were the second most voted on games in the top 10 list. Uh, after that, it was Sivu, Kirby, and the Forgotten Land, and Horizon, who were all tied with uh, four vote-ins each. 
after that, we had Vampire Survivors and Cult of the Lamb with three votes each. And then Immortality, Marvel Snap, and Pokemon Scarlet and Violet had two points each. So, with that, uh, next up, we've got our honorable mentions, and then after that, I will, uh, uh, after we talk about the honorable mentions here, I'll just want to list off every game that was voted in, because it was such a huge year for video games, and I want to make sure every game gets their moment of love, like the seven games on Mike's list that did not make the top ten. <laughs> <laughs> I love that for you. <laughs> so... Uh, a little factoid here, 42 uh, total games were voted on uh, this year, uh, moving up from 34 from last year. Wow. Like last year, 11 games made it onto the top 10. Uh, and this year, only two games outside of the top 10 got 10 or more points. That doesn't necessarily mean it was those were the only two games that got voted on twice, but I just thought that was a little interesting. So, coming in at 13th place with nine points is Tunic. Ah! Anyone Tunic have anything to say mine. there? Yeah, yeah. Tunic was, uh, I think, a game that just really blew me away with its instruction manual mechanic. I don't think there's anything that's been more creative than that this year. Um, a game that I just kind of panned after we had that demo. I was like, uh, th this is not Death Store. It wants to be Death Store, and Death Store it is not. And it turned out it was actually really, really fucking good. Uh, <laughs> and I think the... The discoverability in what you could do in this game with uh, unlocking all these instruction manual pages and how that kind of lent itself to the core gameplay, I think was just so smart and so clever. And um, the way it also lent itself to puzzles that you didn't even know were puzzles. You thought they were just decorations on the wall and suddenly you're, you've got this notepad out and you're writing down all this shit and it's just, it, I just fell so in love with this game. It's, it's, it was just, it's such a special experience, you know? Yeah, Tunic was number, I think, six for me on my list. Um, it's one that I do have beefs with, so it's not like my most... I wasn't like ridiculously excited to put it on there, but I had to give it like its respect because I think it does so many things so well um, in terms of that exploration that Andy was getting at. Like Again, the instruction manual, I think at a glance, and that's kind of what's going against Tunic, people kind of look at it and they're like, I don't know, it's like Zelda, but there's a fox, and I guess you have a book, like whatever. But once you play it, it really reveals how special it is in how that manual functions and the interactivity that you have with that manual. Like, that could have so easily just been a surface level thing, but this game is just oozing with like mystery and secrets. And like, I'm no completionist by any means, but like, if you want to go into the weeds, you can do some wild stuff with that. Like, I remember talking to people during the review period or afterwards and being like, oh, did you ever figure out what to do with this weird, like, glitch thing where you're like inside a wall kind of and you keep like regenerating they're like i don't know what you're talking about and i'm like i don't know what i'm talking about but i got here <laughs> i got here there was a file on my screen it was very like old school in that sense like a file on my screen that had like all these weird numbers or something yeah. and i like i never quite like figured out what that was but like having stuff like that was so fascinating really the only thing that i ding tunic for is the combat i was not a big fan of um i just didn't feel like it flowed as nicely as like if we think of it in comparison to death's door I think if we took the exploration of Tunic and the combat of Death's Door, we'd have, like, the perfect video perfect game. 100%. Game, yeah. um, but still, like, it was so fun. And I really like also the um, different difficulty and accessibility options Tunic did offer, which I very uh, much took advantage of because I'm like, I ain't going to get good enough to do this. I'm just going to, you know, tweak some things here and there in the background. So it really allowed for you to do that, too, if you maybe found the combat to be a little bit too challenging. But... Um, so many wonderful things about that. The style is also just very gorgeous as well. So, yeah, Tunic is low-key a lot deeper than people realize because a lot of people just decided they didn't feel like making the time for it or want to spend more time with it. But I promise if you spend a, like a few hours with it, you'll start to see what really makes this sing in a way that's more special than a lot of games that came out this year, in my opinion. Yeah, the only reason it didn't make my top 10 was the uh, for sure the combat especially when you get into the boss fights, I don't think that combat justifies like the difficulty yes. spikes. It really reminds me of Kana Bridge of Spirits in that way. And it just in a way that did not become fun. But like we mentioned last year, like if I could give an award for best mechanic in a game this last year, it would be the, the discoverability of the um, instruction. The, manual. The, yeah. The instruction manual and stuff like that. So, yeah. Cool, All right. Up. Coming in at number 12 with 10 points. Ali Ali World. Wow. That was me. <laughs> yeah, that was me as well, Jay. <laughs> Tell I, us about did it, anyone Janet. else put it on their list but me? Uh, yeah, me? that was my uh, number eight oh, right yeah. there, Janet. You, you want to kick it off for me? Yeah, that game rocks. That oh, yeah. game is a ton of fun, and we talk about it like that neon white when you brought up the 
Restart, one more try, one more try. That is what Ali Ali World was, and it was so much fun. The pastel colors, right? The character customization I made, Bob's from Bob's Burgers, and I was just shredding Hell the yeah. gnar all the time. And it is so much fun to link up that perfect run and look at it and go, nice job, you did it. Or go, hey, what if I took that left instead of the right, and I went on a different route? And what if I try to do all of the challenges, like, it is a blast of a game, and I love being able to do the retry and just keep doing it over and over. And the world was really cool, right? Like, I don't Narvana is what it, yep. they were calling it or something like that. Like, I loved the skater references. I loved the characters. I loved this cool, cartoony, out of this world world that they created. Like, it was a really dope time. Yeah, like I'm someone that I played a little bit of I think the original like Ali Ali games, and I was like, holy cow, this thing is like way too hard for me because <laughs> it was very button combo focused in its like original state, like in those earlier games. So when I stepped to Ali Ali World, I really wasn't sure what I was gonna get and like how it would jive with me. But I think they did so many smart things, again, playing towards that high and low difficulty, depending on what you wanna go for. Mm -hmm. So again, just finishing the level, not too, too bad. But if you wanna get some of those challenges, if you wanna up your score, they do like such cool things with having like different NPC characters have almost like a play on the like bronze, silver, gold type thing. But it's like through these other characters that you're trying to like beat their high score on. Um, there's also like, this is a surprisingly really cute game. Like there's like these cat balloons and it's like, oh, don't hit them or do hit them. There's side quests in this game, which is wild because they put the side quest on the track. So like you like take a different path and you're like talk to a character really quick while you're skating. Um, again, with the appreciation to skate culture, like I'm not a skateboarder, but I am a roller skater. Obviously a lot of the materials are similar. You can customize everything. They got the trucks, the wheels, the like different gear and everything. Like it totally gets it. Like it gets what is fun about the sport, about the movement. But unlike real skating, you can't get physically hurt, which is great. Cause I'm like, <laughs> all right, I can bust my shit as much as I want and nothing's going to happen to me. Um, and they do such fun stuff with the level design. At one point there, were, there's a world where there's giant bees and they carry a billboard and you skate on the billboard. <sighs> Like, it is such a freaking good, fun game. Like, I think it just totally nails what is it like to be in the zone with a video game. That's Ali Ali World. Yeah. All right. And the honorable mention coming in at 11th place with 12 points, just one point off from the top 10, is Cuphead, the delicious oh. last oh. course. Hell yeah. Of course, that was on my list coming in at number six. Love it. Uh, it is not as much content as the full game. Obviously, it's DLC, but I think that it, it has enough content that it feels more like a standalone game than just more of Cuphead. I really loved the um, different types of challenges they introduced in this one, and the you know visual style of Cuphead is like one of the most important parts mm -hmm. of what makes it special. I love that they went further into like how much more fun can we have with this that we didn't in the first game. The claymation stuff that they do, um, the challenges with the different chess pieces, I thought was really cool and. Uh, a, a fun way to twist up what is essentially very like repetitive gameplay of different bosses over and over with different forms. It was just uh, a, a fun enough twist of like focusing on the parrying as opposed to just shooting that I really enjoyed. Um, adding Miss Chalice as a different play style as a different character I thought was really cool. Um, and yeah, there's a, a ton of ton of great content here. Some of the more creative boss designs I think uh, in the franchise, a lot more verticality, which I appreciated. I hope we get a lot more Cuphead. I hope we get it soon. <laughs> you but will I'm, not get it soon. At the end of the day, I'm happy we got this. Uh, it, it was many years in the making, and I think it was definitely worth the wait. Yeah, for me, this is number four on my list. This was a big deal. This was something really special. Out of all the games on my list, this is the one I wish did crack into our top ten because this was a dope moment. This was a lot of fun, and especially for someone who is a new beginner or just bad at Cuphead, the original game, right? The things that they added, right? The gameplay elements of Miss Chalice, but also the tracking shooting missile, right? Like, they added something in there where if you're really bad at this game, it takes one less stress off of you where you can focus on, hey, just shoot any random direction. It will hit there. Focus on dodging. Focus on moving. And, like, that made the game so much fun for me to jump in see the dlc island and then jump into the main game right and i think i'm sure there's a lot of people who are just like me who took advantage of that and really had a great experience right tim brought up the verticality i'll never forget the crazy dog in the airplane right and being disoriented oh, yeah. on which way am i shooting where am i aiming right like this was a ton of fun i loved the cuphead dlc it is a master class in artwork and video game design like it is really really cool so a special one there that's my number four that's up there 
Uh, and then with that, really quick, uh, just want to also uh, mention weighted scores, something that I always uh, play around with on the back end. Uh, where, you know, uh, what if we gave number one, or number one's 15 points and then number two, 10 points, and then uh, one point, so on and so forth. And unlike last year, where I played around with that as a fun little <laughs> thing, our uh, weighted score uh, list was all over the place uh, compared to the main list last year. This year, it was almost exactly the same. The only difference would have been Vampire Survivors and Immortality would have swapped places. So Immortality would have been tied with Marvel Snap, uh. and Vampire Survivors would have gone up to number seven, which I think showcases like how, like even though you here? might not feel like all your games made it on here, like for the most part as a core group, we were kind of all like on the same page to an extent on uh, what the games uh, that we loved were this year. And for those in the chat who are upset that maybe their game that they loved wasn't on here, let me read off really quick what the other games that were written in were. So uh, going in kind of the uh, opposite order of how people voted here, uh, we've got Rumbleverse, Escape Academy, Callisto Protocol, WWE 2K22, yeah! uh, Sonic Frontiers, <laughs> As Dusk <laughs> Falls, Live go. Alive, Overwatch 2, Metal Hellsinger, Citizen Sleeper, Nobody Saves the World, Shredders, Gran Turismo 7, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Patrick's Parabox, Pokemon Legends Arceus, Splatoon 3, Crisis Core Final Fantasy 7 Reunion, <laughs> Roller Drum, Rogue Legacy 2, Signalis, A Plague Tale Requiem, Mario Plus Rabbit, Sparks of Hope, Tinykin, Eyelets, TMNT, Shredder's Revenge, yeah. Stray, and Pentiment. And on that last note, Xbox Boys, where the fuck were you on Pentiment? I played it over the break and it became my it's number so four, and neither of you fucking voted for it. What up? What happened there? You gotta read, man. Yeah, it's too much reading. Hey, do you like history and reading? Yeah. Fuck no. <laughs> no, I don't. Thank you. I, was, I had to double check to see you. I was like, did I vote Patrick's Pair Box? I forgot Janet yeah, also yeah. played it. <laughs> I love that. I love, I love how many games were just named that like didn't make it to the top yeah. ten, but we're on one of our top ten lists, man. Video games are cool, whether it's indie, triple A, so many fun things represented here on our top ten list and beyond. Uh, really interested in what 2023's list gonna, is going to look like. We have so many games coming out. Um, for, again, tri uh, indie or triple A, it's about to be another wild year. Greg, do you have any closing thoughts on all this? No, Tim. What a great year for games. What a great list. I'm super proud of that list, uh, and I think it was awesome. Great job, of course, uh, Barrett, for assembling all this, doing all the stats, running all that. Andy with the graphics. Kevin in there helping out on this. Fran like, on the VO. Yeah. Fran and Mirabelle with third. Well, yeah, shout yeah. out to Fran, who gave me 20 takes of Cult of Lamb. Cult of Lamb. <laughs> Cult of Lamb. I love it. God bless you. And him. shout out to the amazing developers for making all these amazing mm -hmm. games. Yes, you're man. all winners. Yeah. Just yeah. making the list means you're a winner, and if you Thank didn't, you your so game much. sucked. And shout out to the Steam Deck for making it easier to play them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. What a Where's time Stranger of Paradise alive. Plus? Where is Stranger Where of Paradise? Is it? <laughs> that was my number 11. Yeah, you're going to have to kill Chaos another time. Let us know in the comments below what your top 10 would be, uh, what you think of our list, and hey, you know what? Whatever you want to put down there. Just make sure that it is nice and respectful. I'm sure that it will be. Uh, but I love you all. Thank you so much for supporting us and allowing us to do really cool things. Um, the spare bedroom has been a dream come true, and it's really fun to be able to do bigger productions like this, try to have a little bit more fun uh, with some of the motion graphics and have you know Kevin and Barrett both in the control and working together to make this uh, run super well and super dope. Having Jen and Paris fly up here to, to be here is super fun as well. And of course, just hanging out with all y'all talking video games like we do here on youtube.com slash kind of funny games. Really quick, Tim, one more time. Do you want to recap what the top 10 was? Yes, the top 10 of 2022 for kind of funny is number 10, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Number nine, Cult of the Lamb. Number eight, a tie of Marvel Snap and Vampire Survivors. Number seven, Immortality. Number six, Neon White. Number five, Horizon Forbidden West. Number four, Kirby in the Forgotten Land. Number three, Sifu. Number two, Elden Ring. And number one, God of War, Ragnarok. Congratulations once again to everybody else. And until next time, I love you all. Goodbye.